Advocacy is actually one of our most important mandates for BEBC. There's a lot of black serving organizations, but the one thing we've missed is advocating for us within policy. If you look at programs, if you go to the government, they'll say we have a lot of programs for small businesses. But most of the time when black businesses try to sign up for those programs, we don't qualify. Because the criteria that has been put together eliminates us. They don't do that knowingly. It's just we're not at the table when the criteria is being put together. And so BEBC's most important job is to, to, to be in that table. We are doing everything we can, relationships with ministers, with the federal government, with the provincial government, with the city government, to be at that table. So when, when any sort of policy is being made, any criteria is being made for programs, we want to be there so that when the criteria is out and we apply for programs, we can actually get in. So there is a lot of programs to support businesses, but we don't qualify for them most of the time. So our advocacy is to make sure, A, we are at the table, we are advocating for ourselves, or if there's anything coming in terms of funding, in terms of grants, that we can actually have access to it. And speaking to the government in terms of new programming, right? We want to make sure we are at those tables, not just asking for programming, but affecting how that programming is being done so that when it's actually launched and black businesses can go in, they can succeed in actually getting money. And so policy advocacy, program advocacy, and that's just not with the government only, it's also with the corporations. So essentially with any sort of society where you bring people together, they have a goal and the goal could be to bring the collective together in order to achieve something. For BEBC, we are advocating for you. What we are really doing here is uh, providing a platform to lift your, to, to, to allow you to leverage things. And in this case, we are providing a platform, for example, for you to be able to access uh, the, the procurement programs uh, or services for government and corporation. We're providing a platform whereby we are able to gather more black business together to create connections and synergies as a, a platform. So when we advocate for you, we really are here to support you and really provide you with um, the, the platform that you need in order to lift you. Welcome to the BEBC's second annual Black Business Summit, powered by CVent and supported by EDC, BDC, TD Bank, and several other amazing partners. We are part of the MC team for this event, and you'll meet the lovely Candace Lauren tomorrow. For day one, I'm your host, Jordan, and this is my co-host, Wasim. We are excited that the day is finally here, guys. There's so much to unpack for day one, so let's begin. Uh, to start, let's just do a quick overview of all the exciting and inspiring things that we have planned for us uh, with all the incredible community of entrepreneurs. But first, uh, we got to mention social media. You know, it's 2023. And so if you're on Facebook, if you're on Instagram, if you're on LinkedIn, please share your experience throughout the day with the world. And don't forget to hashtag uh, BEBC Summit and follow us at BEBC Society. Okay, Wasim, tell us a bit more about what we have coming up. Well, we have an incredible keynote speaker, the inspiring Allison Bird, leading us in day one of the summit. And we will finish out on day two with the right honorable Mikhail Jean. We have a session of breakouts and mentor meetups that you've pre selected, and we know you're going to get a ton of value by attending. Don't forget to get involved, ask questions, and participate. That's the best way to get everything you need to learn and grow in your business. We also have some essential conversations and remarks from a great leader in the community, Chief Janice George from the Squamish Nation. Tanoya Bin Sequato, Ayas Chab Tanoya, Japhemia Siam Koshaman Sna, Tanachent Las Nak, Askahok Mishlohomeoch, On Wanacht and Squalowin. On Wanacht and Squalowin, I'm here with a respectful heart, and I said peace to every one of you here this morning. I am Japhemia Siam. My English name is Chief Janice George and I'm a hereditary chief from the Squamish Nation. And I'm so honored to welcome you to this space. Um, it, it's uh, 
it just reminds me so much of how the people work, how our people work. Chen Chen's Dwight, and it's something that we've, we're always taught. It's one of the foundational teachings of our people, and that's holding each other up. I commend you on the work that you're doing, and I urge you and, um, and uh, encourage you. As our elders say, I urge you and encourage you to keep up your good work and um, work together, um, open heart and open mind, working together for the better of us all. So I just say, I, I encourage you on your work today. I hope the ancestors are with you to whisper in, the, in your ear the things that you need to hear and, and fill your heart with the things that you need to feel. Othian. Hey everyone, uh, thank you so much, uh, Chief Janice. We are so honored that you could come and uh, bless our, our event. And uh, we're just so thankful to be living and thriving on this land. So thank you so much, Chief Janice. Um, and as we bring everyone in today, welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Jackie Kasandi. I'm the founder and CEO of BEBC. And today we've got almost 570 of you with people from Africa and England and UK and a lot of people in Canada. Just so excited to be welcoming you all to this really wonderful event. We've got so many good things uh, planned for you, great hosts and inspirational speakers. So welcome aboard, have a wonderful time. The team is gonna let you know how to navigate through the next two days. And I'm just so excited to introduce such amazing people to you and make sure you use the chat functions and all the other good stuff to build community and converse with us and ask questions if you're having any issues but just enjoy yourself talk take lots of notes and we're here for you to learn to get inspired and then to support you after the summit so that we can help you grow and scale and just you know make your business as successful as you need so welcome to the bebc summit 2023 so take it away, Jordan and Wasim, to give people the rundown for the conference. Thank you. Beautiful. Welcome back, guys. So real quickly, we're just going to do a rundown for the day. Um, when you logged into the Cvent platform today, you landed on the home page. And at the top of that page are tabs to make it easy for you to navigate the platform. Okay. So to attend, to attend each session throughout the summit, just click the live event tab and proceed to all sessions. Click in and out of sessions to join, okay? Now, if you want to network and engage with other summit attendees, click on the community tab and you can access a list of attendees, discussions, and the summit game. In the game, attendees are awarded points for completing tasks throughout the event. By completing the sets of tasks, attendees finish challenges and earn badges. Next tab on the navigation is the Expo tab. Please take time to visit our exhibitors and say hello, please, please, please. They are standing by to connect and answer your questions. Okay, the summit platform slash program um, to come. So for today's agenda, just take a real quick look with me here. We have the opening remarks were just done and the land acknowledgements, okay. Um, very shortly, we're going to be moving to the keynote by Allison Berg, and then we're going to go over to the Black Pitch Contest videos. Then we're going to do the Financial Roundtable. That's going to be a lot of fun, uh, followed by the Fireside Chat with Jackie Cassandi and Eldon Holder. And then we have the Black Youth Entrepreneurship, Part 1 by Tony and Part 2 by Brittany Charlton. Okay, and then we're just going to do some closing remarks, and there will be a cool little networking session, which I advise you strongly to be a part of. And uh, before we move on, I just want to really quickly let you guys know about all of our beautiful sponsors. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We have TD, BBC, Cvent, Van City, Volition, RBC, Government of Canada, NBC, and Cassandi. All of these uh, beautiful, beautiful companies have come together to make all of this possible. Okay. Um, Wasim, can you tell us a bit more about this? Yes, there are also three informative panel conversations with experts from banking, business, marketing, and media. The expertise on these panels will blow you away. 
You all have the agenda thanks to one of our partners, Cvent, from the BEBC Summit website, and we hope you can participate in all we have to offer you today. However, if you do have to miss any portion of it, you can look it up and watch it for up to one year. Please take advantage of that. It's a great resource for you. We have some fun stuff too. There is a game that will run during the whole day. Take note of the various ways and you can get points or actions you can take to win fabulous prizes. Also, make sure to engage in the chat with your questions. The winners from these engaging activities will receive amazing prizes, including a gift basket from Cassidy store between 100 bucks to 600 bucks worth of gift cards. We have some etiquette. We recommend the following. Um, turn off your phone, anything that will distract you. Get comfortable and be prepared to take notes. When asking questions in the Q plus A, please be respectful and please share your experience on social media. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. So without further delay, I'm excited to welcome Jackie Cassandi back to kick off the next session. Hi, guys. Welcome back. I cannot Hi. wait to introduce you guys to our keynote speaker today. She is amazing. She's beautiful. And I'm sure she's going to really inspire you. Her name is Alison Bird. She's widely known as the Profit Accelerator She's unapologetic. And so we can't wait to hear from her about everything she's about to share with us. When she stepped into her purpose in 2009, the only thing predictable about her was the future she would create for Lisa Nichols, motivating the masses uh, and an increase of 1,080% for MTM's event sales and back of room profits in a span of 18 months. For real, like I want that for myself. Yeah, it just it's how it seems and sounds like an insanity. Trust it. It's as authentic as her heart is open. So fast forward, and Alison Bird is now up-leveling her clients' profitability in ways that transform lives and the world. So with the release of the Alison with the Bird Agency, Alison has created a company that mirrors all that she stands for. Uh, as a strategist and as a mentor. She's got the energy, the power, and the mastery to ch uh, that is charged in each business she has touched. Uh, with long-term focus and an emphasis on sustain sustainability and almost excessive profits, uh, she has traveled everywhere in the world. Um, and uh, today we get to have her here to share her story with us and to teach us a little bit about what she does and what we can learn about becoming profitable, about accelerating our businesses. And I'm actually very eager to learn from her and hopefully soon to become her client. And she gets to tell us today and inspire us today so we can do as well as, she, as, as uh, her clients are doing. And so, yeah. Welcome, Alison Bird, with me. Alison Bird, welcome, and take it away. So what I instill in you over the next few moments, what's going to be required for you to receive it? Well, one of the things that you just heard uh, Jackie say about me is that for years, I've been behind the scenes of some of the greatest talents in the personal and professional development industry. For years, I've been mentored by them. For years, they brought me onto their teams. For years, I've given myself permission to be a coach, a strategist, a leader for those that are influencing and impacting society in a significant way. But I didn't start out that way. See, I started out really caught between a dream and a job. And why was I stuck there? Well, let's just start out with my childhood. I was raised by a single mom. My mom worked three jobs. And while she gave us a lot of attention, a lot of hope, a lot of faith, a lot of belief, here's the truth. A woman working three jobs can only give you so much. A black woman in America raising two children on her own with two fathers not present can only give her children so much because her mind was also consumed with what about my destiny? What about my dreams? What about the things that I've placed on hold? I thought I was going to have a marriage with man number one. Oh, that didn't work out. I thought it was going to work with man number two. That didn't work out. And I've got this desire inside of my soul and I don't feel like I have enough bandwidth make it happen for me. 
And so how many of you can relate to that? How many of you can relate to, am I behind? Have I missed my moment? Is it too late for me? Was having my children the best idea? <laughs> Was going into that college education the best idea? Come on, let's have some real talk. Because when we're looking at how do I get from good to great and from great to extraordinary in my life, someone has to come and have a heart to heart, belly to belly, shoulder to shoulder conversation that says, let's pay attention to the real questions that are happening inside of your mind. Let's love on ourselves with enough clarity and enough consciousness to know who we've been and who we're becoming are not one and the same. And there is enough space in our lifetime to reiterate who we are and who we're choosing to be. So when I stepped into the marketplace, I wasn't Allison Bird, the profit accelerator. I wasn't the human that had accelerated the sales or supported leaders to master their energetics, to stand on stages in front of tens of thousands of people and make hundreds of millions of dollars. That wasn't me. I was the little black girl that grew up without a daddy. I identified on the inside. And so when the market said, hey, Here's a live streaming platform. I was like, I don't know if I wanna be seen. My father left me, my father abandoned me. So I don't know if I wanna get in front of an audience that can say something that could crush me. Come on, if you can relate, drop an I can relate in the chat. If you can relate, write on your paper, I can relate. If you can feel these words in your body, because what I instill in you over the next few moments requires that you have already made the internal agreement that the patterns that you have lived and have memorized as your identity aren't really you. See, the truth was I was more of the identity that I had been raised. You look just like your dad. Girl, you sound just like your mom. Girl, you can sing just like so-and-so. You can speak just like so-and-so. But what about me? What about who I am? And so my family didn't have it in their lexicon of language to speak into my future, to prophesy over me and say, you sound like yourself. You speak like yourself. What are the creative ideas that are moving through you? What are the desires on your heart? How can we support you to thrive in your own identity, in your own destiny? It's not because my family was wrong. In the generations in which we grew up, that was not the conversation. So where we are today, that conversation now. And so over the next few moments, I encourage you to look within so that you can make an internal agreement to question the patterns in your life that have become so solidified that they seem like the core identity of you. Because when, it, when we operate with the consciousness that we're gonna step from a job into entrepreneurship, well, entrepreneurship is just another level of career. Once you get into entrepreneurship, that level of career invites you to cross a bridge into your calling. Somebody hashtag calling in the chat. Somebody write down calling on your paper. Somebody pull that word into your heart because a calling is when you know like you know like you know with inevitability, I am meant to do this. A career, you will always question your success, but a calling, you will know my success must meet me because who I be demands it. I want everybody to take a deep breath in and I want you to let it out. I want you to feel these words because I didn't live this life. I didn't become this example to step on a stage and teach a cute one, two, three, ABC message. I have a responsibility because I'm living my birthright. I'm living my inherited destiny. I'm living prosperity. What's the distinction between profits and prosperity? One comes with peace and one comes with work. Oh, I need to say that again. When you are working, you can garner profit. When you are in a state, a consciousness, a beingness of peace, because you are living your purpose, then you will live a life of prosperity. 
All right, let's back it up a little bit because I want to tell you a little bit about how I began so that you can see the roadmap of how I became this person that is bold, that is contagious, that is tenacious, and that is willing to activate and unlock you in ways that you didn't even know you could be unlocked. My message right now is literally a key to your throat chakra. It's literally going right here and going and opening up your voice so that whether you're speaking about real estate or you're speaking about insurance or you're speaking about body work, whether you're, an, whether you're a leader that says, I'm gonna create the next t-shirt, I'm gonna do the next widget, the next gadget, that you know like you know like you know your success is inevitable. So I grew up in Texas where being a black woman that was underpaid, being a black woman that was underestimated, being a black woman that was undereducated and under esteemed was normalized. So it was pretty normal that people around you just underestimate who you're gonna be and what you're going to do. So as a result, I chose to drop out of high school at 15 years old. And then I stepped into criminal activities by the age of 16, cause I was bored. I didn't have anything to do with my gift and talent. So I was like, uh, can somebody tell me what to do? And guess who shows up when you don't know what to do? A criminal, <laughs> a criminal. And so I went to jail by 17, only been to jail once. It was one overnight experience. It was enough to teach me. I never wanted to go back. And then I quickly grew my body to over 315 pounds, all the way to 345 pounds, but 315 by the age of 21 years old. I was literally burying myself alive. And more than anything, I was becoming the brand of human based on what I was seeing. And what I was seeing was only the bad parts because I felt so bad inside. And so I want you to come away with an awareness that if you feel bad inside, you will see bad on the outside. If your inner world is crowded with internal gossip, write that statement down. Allison, what is internal gossip? It's where I'm going to talk within myself about myself and I'm not going to say anything good. Girl, you know you did that the last time. Girl, you know you failed. Girl, you know that don't work. You know what they're going to think about this. Oh, don't put that post up because somebody is going to say this. Oh, you better think about this again. That internal gossip will keep you rotating and recycling and regurgitating the same life. And I felt so bad inside because the conditioning of the environment that I was living in was rooted in scarcity, not enoughness, overwhelm, and fear. Allison, get us to the good part. I'm in the good part because I'm in the part that relates to you. I'm in the part that says, I get you. I don't just understand you, I overstand you. I know the path of greatness. And the path of greatness requires that someone lovingly care fronts you and says, your past is not your present. And in order for you to delineate the two, you've gotta have a wake up call and this is one of them. See, I was living an unawakened existence and my life was giving me everything that I believed I could have. Nothing. Nothing. Because everything I got, somehow I lost it. I'd get a car, car would get repoed. I'd get an apartment, eviction notice go on the door. Like this was my old theme of living. Nothing worked for me. And so how did I get into a theme of life? I like to call it a theme because it really is my imagination that brought me here. How did I get here? How did I get to this place imbued, as Zora Neale Hurston would say, imbued with confidence, embodied with love, stripped of my judgments, See, I didn't come to be your guru today. I came to be your evidence. I came to say, look at me and look at the mountains that I have climbed again and again and again. 
energetically, I feel some of you asking, can you repost this on Instagram? Yes, you can. I'm at I am Allison Bird, A-L-L-Y-S-O-N. Please tag me. Please be my Instagram today. <laughs> Please post on Facebook. Please write a blog on Pinterest from what I said. Please do it all. Put me on medium with you, do all the things. See, here's the reality. In today's society, there is a literal genocide on your authenticity and your personal power. There's a genocide against it because the world is uncomfortable with a human that does not hate themselves. The world is very uncomfortable with a human that's not shrinking back and going, oh, I don't think I'm enough. See, it reminds me of the story of the little engine that could. In the little engine that could, uh, there's a train on its way to deliver toys. Some of you have read it. If not, I'll give you a little summary. So there's a train on the way to deliver toys to children in need. But on the way, the train breaks down. So there's a track next to it, and there's an engine that comes and rides through, and the train says, yo, 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 can you help me? And the engine that rides by looks at it and is really haughty and kind of goes, mm, I'm sorry, who are you? And he says, look, you know, I've got this assignment. I got to get this, you know, over to these kids. Can you just help me? And the engine judges it and says, no, I would never help you. You're not good enough. You're not wearing Givenchy. You're not dressed in Tom Ford. I don't see no Versace robe when you putting on your makeup in the morning on Instagram stories. I would never help you. See, that's cultural programming that says, if you don't look the part, then I don't wanna be aligned with you. Some of you have been scorned by that. And because you've been scorned, you don't trust your own self. You don't trust your own season. See, before I walked into a Gucci store and had a shopper, I was walking into Ross dressed for less in the US, which is, you know, going through the little discount store. I love the scripture in the sacred Christian text that says, learn to be faithful with little and learn to abound in much. And so here was this engine with a mission being judged by someone that they perceived, can you help me? And the engine said, I would never help you. And so the engine sits there and says, okay, this is the little kid's story. Google it. If, you, if you've never really read it, it's pretty prolific. Because then another engine comes by. And this engine comes by in deficit. This engine is like, oh, um, I don't think I'm good enough. Um, I don't think I can help you. How many of you have been at a networking event? And you've met someone and you can see their brilliance and you could go, oh, if they do this and I do this, we can get this idea off the ground. And they're like, mm, I might be able to meet you on Tuesday. And then Monday night comes around and they send you a text. Oh, my kid's sick. And you're like, are you kidding me? You got all this good, good inside of you. And if we put ourselves together, we can literally bring this mission to fruition. And they're like, mm, no, I don't think I can. And that hurts you. Because your instinct and your insight, your intellect and your intuition start going, am I wrong? How come I can see their greatness? How come I can feel my greatness? How can I see my path to purpose and to helping others? And none of these mother suckers want to help me. What is really going on? Come on, if you can relate, drop and I can relate. See, I came to be your friend in this moment. I came to be your heart in this moment. I came to speak your truth in this moment. I came to disrupt your world in this moment so that you can live in the existence that you truly desire. But you cannot get from where you are to where you want to be with the same level of thinking that you started with. You must expand your economy of attention in order to expand your capability so that you allow yourself to be great. Woo! Listen, this is what love sounds like. This is what overcoming sounds like. This is what the heart of the matter sounds like. Cultural programming is bleeding all around us with mediocrity and smallness and performative humility as the brand of human that works in this world. But is it really working for anyone? Because I know for sure it has not worked for me. 
The lifestyle of cultural conditioning can leave you addicted to inadequacy because you start to anticipate, well, that one person judged me. Well, that one person let me down. Well, that must mean no one is reliable. And you even start saying sentences like, no one is reliable. No one is hireable. You cannot find any good team. And you start casting those spells over your life and then wondering why you live those realities. Your thoughts become things because the things are what you're speaking. And then you make them your reality and then want to act shook it when it happens. <gasps> and dare to call your accountability partner. Girl, you know what happened. Bruh, remember when so-and-so said that went down for me? Well, of course it went down for you. Everybody prophesied it. <laughs> Oh my gosh, this is going to liberate and free so many of you. So when the little engine that could, it was the third train that came. And the third train was a little bit raggedy, but the third train had gone through just enough life to know to ask a good question. Reverend Dr. Michael Beckwith says the quality of life uh, expands to the quality or the context or the texture of the questions that we ask. And so that third engine reminds me of me. I've been weathered by life. I've manifested love and then I've given that love back to the universe. I've manifested the body that I wanted, then I gave that back to the universe because I got sad. I fell, fell into a default of eating the pizza and baking the cupcakes and finding my peace in that. Some people have a story of overcoming cocaine. I had to overcome cupcakes. I'm not belittling cocaine. I'm telling you addiction is addiction. Crack is crack for real. And sugar is one of the most bypassed addictions that so many of us have. And so here I was loading my body, loading my body. And nobody is like, hey, girl, you think you want to? But if I was smoking crack all the time in front of people, they would say something. Some of the addictions that we have, including the addiction to inadequacy, no one really knows how to speak up about it. No one really knows how to say, baby, I, I think you're addicted to playing small. I think you're addicted to invisibility. I think you're addicted to not having enough. I think you're addicted to being disappointed. I think you're addicted to something that does not serve you and you're tweaking out in the marketplace like, uh, I, 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 I'm really trying to live this destiny. I'm really trying to be this uh, game changer. Uh, I really want to pioneer a new thought and a new consciousness, but I, uh, uh, come on. Mm. I feel you. I feel you. And that's why this moment is so prolific for you because I am ironing this into the memory of you so that your awakening is so sweet to you. So that you say, whoa, that was the day. Not that I believed bigger. That was the day I gave myself permission to reimagine my life. That was the day I said, oh, I'm gonna bypass belief and just step into what could I imagine? What's beyond my belief? So the weathered engine that came on the second track said, well, well, what's what you got going on? What are you doing? And the broken down train said, well, I, I've got these kids that are on the other side and and they're waiting for me. They're waiting for me to 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 bring this joy to them, these toys. And it's they're going to laugh and they're going to play and they're going to feel good. And the engine in the other track said, oh, wait a minute, you got a purpose. Wait, wait, wait one minute. You've got a calling on your life and your calling is going to ripple into the lives of our next generation. Oh, hold on. I think I can. Read the story. It's a pretty inspiring story. And the two of them decided that teamwork could make the dream work. And they linked their trains together and then together they both said, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. 
both of them decided to leave the cult of average. What is the cult of average? It's the addiction to inadequacy. It's the addiction to mediocrity. It's the addiction to uh, not following through on your word. It's the addiction to being so busy in place of being successful and significant. It's the addiction to strategy over strategy over strategy versus surrender and allowing. See, I came with a mega wattage warning that what you are receiving in this day, what you are receiving in this season of life is designed to work in your life and through your life and for your life. And the question that I'm asking is, will you allow it? Because majority of the resistance that we face is the resistance inside of us. Most of us want to say it's others. Ooh, Allison, you don't understand my family. Ooh, Allison, you don't understand my friends or my husband or my partner or my wife or my spouse or my this or my that. Well, let me invite you into a consciousness as I close this moment that we have together. There is an old self of you. And that old self, that familiar self, that practice self, that self gets to complete today. You get to give yourself permission to be a new self, a true self, your highest essence of self. You get to decide that. You get to decide by saying, I'm ready for my new self. See, the old self performs, but you get to shed that today. See, the old self performs and people pleases. And let me tell you something. If you're people pleasing, you are going to bypass your prosperity because you will never give yourself permission to be different. You will be fighting for belonging to a crowd and a community that will never elevate you and definitely will never show you your path to your consistent cash flow. Allison, how do I know if I'm operating in my old self? How do I know if I'm operating in my new self? Today is my baseline. What if today was your new baseline as the worst day in your life? And it's already bomb. I'm in it. And what if today was the new baseline as the worst day in your life? You're being prepared. You're being groomed. And this is now the baseline. Like, wow, every day from here gets better and better. Well, let's talk about how that can happen. One, write these things down. Whenever you are being your old self, you will always regurgitate criticism, comparison, or judgment. Whenever you're being your old self, Dr. Joe Dispenza says that by the time we're 35, 95% of who we are is borrowed. And so most of us borrow even our criticisms from those that we grew up with. My girlfriend said something the other day, and when she said it, I said, who was that? Because you don't even believe what you said. I know you well enough to know you don't believe that. She said, oh, girl, that was my auntie coming through my mouth. I said, yes, it was. Now, what do you really want to say? So your old self will always perform through criticism, through comparing, making you compare yourself, and through judgment. But your highest self, your true self, the essence of you will always invite you to play curious. Is that true for us? Is that true for us in 2023? Is that true for us now? See, I have to ask myself, my mother raised me having been born in 1951. So when she grew up, there were signs on the door that said, for, you know, for whites only or for coloreds only or no coloreds allowed or a colored um, uh, water fountain or things like that. And so my mother raised me with some parameters that helped to keep me safe based on what kept her safe. But now in 2023, she didn't understand that I would be in the top 1% of African-American earners in North America. She didn't understand that. She didn't know that I would grow up to impact over 10,000 students that would generate $330 million in new sets. She didn't understand that. She didn't understand that her baby girl would be seen in Forbes and USA Today and have a special on Amazon Prime. She didn't understand that. So she was just grooming me to be safe, not necessarily significant. Woo! 
Oh, oh my goodness. And so many of us in our current generation, we were groomed to be safe versus significant. So today I spoke to you about your existence beyond the status quo. The cult of average groomed all of us with anti-abundance mentalities. They came from our universal, just everything that surround us, you know, uh, watching movies, Disney presented movies that showed rich people were mean, poor people had heart. That was the programming of society to keep us wanting to stay poor. The cult of average groomed us with anti-abundance mentalities in our culture, in our family, our genders, teaching us that certain genders need to be responsible for certain things. Those things were never fully or wholly true. So then as a result, our generation and our age began to even began to regurgitate those anti-abundance mentalities. And then our personal inhibitions and lived experiences began to emulate, oh my goodness, all of these things that were not really true. So I want to leave you with this. I want to leave you with the idea that your uniqueness is necessary and it is now. You are an unrepeatable miracle. There has never been a you and there will never be another. My mentor told me a long time ago, Allison, if both of us are the same, one of us is unnecessary. And so it's an unpopular opinion that the best success happens when you feel good about yourself because you are being yourself. I invite you to embrace your unicorn. You cannot do what everyone else does and create something different. Stop being a unicorn eating horse food. You are a unicorn. Dine with unicorns like you are today. Remember that if you fight for your limitations, you're going to win. And you're going to win results, rewards, and prizes that don't light you up. And you're going to have an existence around you that won't fuel you, but instead will conflate and compress you. 15% of your success is based on your skill to be successful. 85% of your success is based on are you willing to escape the programming that you've known so that you can trust more to flow through you to you and as you. Jackie, back over to you. Alison, I don't even know where to begin or what to say. Our uniqueness is necessary and is now. That 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 is a line we're gonna put everywhere because that's that's so spot on and so true, but something I feel in our community we don't know or we don't embrace. And the, fact, and the fact that we were taught to be safe instead of significant is so true. I could see myself in everything that you just said and shared and I was getting goosebumps all over. And when you talked about the internal gossip, I really appreciated that you said it as internal gossip because it really is gossip because none of it is usually the truth of what we tell ourselves. And then we hold ourselves down. Like you, you've basically been, you've basically been talking and I'm like, yes, yes, preach it, preach it all the way through. Like it reached the deepest sides of me. I can't even tell you. I am just, I am so pleased with everything that you shared. I'm so inspired by you, by your life, by your story. And, and just from where you came from to how successful you are. My first question for you is what has surprised you the most about being on this other side of success, about the success itself, about yourself as a person and about uh, you, your view of business? Mm. Well, that's a really great and broad question. I would say what surprises me the most is how small the circle is. That's what yeah. surprises me. That once you start garnering just a fraction of success, your degrees of separation are so small. So I'm yeah. less than six degrees away from President Barack Obama, Michelle Obama, Oprah Winfrey, less than six degrees away from a Will Smith, a Jada Pinkett Smith, less than six degrees away from a LeBron James. A, like it, it boggles my mind 
how small the circle is because so few humans believe that they can mm -hmm. actually make it in life. And what I yes. recognize is that so many humans are trying to take their basketball talent and be LeBron day one trying to take their broadcasting talent and be Oprah Winfrey day one, trying to take their political ambitions and be President Barack Obama day one. And you have mm -hmm. to know that each and every one of them followed their moment by moment path. And so I like to say mine, M-I-N-E, mind the moment. If you mind yeah. the moment that you're in, that moment will be so good that the next moment will produce itself and that moment will be so good. And then the next moment will produce itself. And before you know it, you have a path that has just been sprinkled with goodness because you're not trying to always make quantum leaps. Instead, you're giving mm -hmm. yourself permission to make quantum shifts moment by mm -hmm. moment by moment, finding your greatness, exploring it, and then letting it produce the path for you. That's amazing. Thank you. What would you say has surprised you about yourself? What has surprised me about myself? How often I forget how great I am. Like I just forget. And it led me to do research on the brain. The average human brain has over 60,000 thoughts in a day. According to science, mm -hmm. over 50% uh, of those are programmed toward negative. Why? That's what led me to understand the societal impact of what our brain is thinking and that our brain is conditioned by the culture around it. It's not conditioned by what we're reading, what we're seeing. It is mm -hmm. conditioned by the feelings that it is in. Yeah. So once I yeah. realized that I spent so much of my life trying to eject uh, because my day-to-day -day life as a child didn't feel good to me and I had judgment against it. Mm -hmm. So then as an adult, I brought that rhythm and that routine into place. And once I started mm -hmm. creating success, I had to unlearn that. And how did I do that? Mm -hmm. Through therapy, through psychotherapy, through coaching, through mentoring, through shamanic healing, and now utilizing psychedelics and plant medicines to continue to expand and heal my path. That's amazing. Um, when you started at the beginning, uh, and, and this is an entrepreneurship conference, so we know that funding and getting any sorts of support at the beginning is very difficult. How did you navigate that before you were able to get to the place of, I'm now successful, I'm actually bringing enough money that I can stand on my own. How was that journey for you? I had a mentor that told me it wasn't difficult and I believe them. I had a mentor that Amazing. told me everybody says it's hard, but it's not. And I was like, okay. Yeah. So my first book, I needed funding for it. And I went mm -hmm. to 20 businesses that I knew. I told them what I was doing. Eight of those businesses yeah. gave me the money. I got it done. Um, my first conference, I needed mm -hmm. $20,000 in order to make that happen. I went to a local bank that I was connected to. I got the funding. I made it happen. I just, because someone told me it wasn't hard, I really yes. believed them. My first investor was someone that was sitting in my classroom and they wanted to buy, I think at that time I had a 20 or $30,000 program to work with me. And my mm -hmm. intuition said, ask them for $50,000 to fund a tour that you wanna do. And wow. I invited them up to my hotel suite and I said, will you give me $50,000 to do what I wanna do? And they said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to do this. They said, sure. I said, okay. Then I lost the 50,000. So then I called them and said, so I lost the 50,000. Will you look at what I did wrong? And will you give me another 50,000 to try it again? They said, sure. And so I know that sounds like, oh, that could never happen for anyone. The only reason it happened for me is because my mentor told me, Sure, it can happen. And they said it was such nonchalance that I went, I think they're telling me the truth. And then I just believed it as truth and I attracted it. So I would say one of the great challenges for a lot of entrepreneurs is they are hanging around naysayers. 
get yourself mm -hmm. around people that speak a different lexicon of language and suddenly you'll yeah. see that your entire world will open up. That's just so amazing. Amazing. I think that the nuggets that I take out of that is the importance of a mentor and not only the importance of a mentor, a mentor who actually really sees you so that you can see yourself and then you can believe them. That's just, Absolutely. That, that's, that's incredible to hear and to have because for me as a black woman, I can't imagine going to someone and saying, can you give me 50K? And then they give it to you and then you lose it. And then you actually goes back and they believe in you. That's just, that's such a high level of self-belief and confidence. And that if you have that, other people will believe in you as well and actually see your dream come true. And you proved all of those people right. And I just, I can't tell you how, how inspired I am. Okay, so I have another question. Can you further elaborate a little bit on small actionable steps that you can recommend for helping me believe in my business self um, and how to get over imposter syndrome? Ooh, okay, two yummy questions. Okay, so one, as we're fostering belief in self, we have to remember that the brain is perpetually forgetting. That the yes. society that we live in today is just overwhelming our minds. And so mm -hmm. I invite everyone to literally just Google how much does my brain forget? Just Google yeah. it. You will laugh so hard and have so much joy because what mm -hmm. I'm about to tell you is you've got to write down how great you are every day, every day. And like yesterday I wrote yeah. and I do this every single day, 10 things I was great at that day. So yesterday mm -hmm. I was really great at listening to a friend. Uh, yesterday I talked to my aunt and she said something that made me think, huh, my cousin didn't tell me that. So that must mm -hmm. mean my cousin is overwhelmed, which means I need to check on her heart because she's my strong friend. And I celebrated yeah. my intuition last night. Like I celebrate yeah. all of those things to continue to remind myself, you have evidence that you are doing good in life. So I would say one actionable step is to every day, yeah write 10 things that you did really well, whether in the business, whether in life, always celebrating your intuition, your intellect, your instinct, and of course your mm -hmm. income goals that, that you tap. And then in regard to imposter syndrome, I teach my client to hunt for imposter syndrome. We want mm -hmm. it. When imposter syndrome comes, we shimmy, baby. We're like, yeah. Because here's the thing, <laughs> you never feel imposter syndrome when you're living the same reality. Imposter mm -hmm. syndrome only shows up when your prayers have been answered. You only feel yeah. fake when you're suddenly around things you've never been around. I didn't feel fake walking into McDonald's. I knew how to order two all beef patty, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, <laughs> onions on a sesame seed bun. But what I didn't yeah. know how to do was walk into the Four Seasons and order a prime Wagyu and, you know, mm -hmm. know how I wanted that made and know that I remember the first time ordering it and I thought that the steak was like $80, but it was $80 every two ounces. So when they brought the bill, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, apparently there was just a little bit of an internet kerfluffle and I'm so grateful for it because it gives me the opportunity to share something that was really moving through me and I did not know if we would have enough time. So I wanted to bring in the conversation that life is a marathon of perpetual evolution, expansion and extraordinary delight. However, what happens when we step into entrepreneurship is we start to omit this conversation of delight. We start to omit that this is a path of adventure. And instead we start to make it, I've got to get it right. And I want you to think about when you went to kindergarten, when you went to kindergarten and you were learning how to write, that was the first time you'd ever done that. 
That was the first time you'd ever experienced that kind of feeling through your hands. Now you may have started at home like I did. My mother started us in preschool. Whatever age you started, it was still something very new. Remember going into grade school where you had to choose your lunch table. You weren't just farmed in with your class. And suddenly you're like, oh my God, I have choice. What does this mean? And that choice was scary. If you sat at a certain table, it meant you were a certain status or you were not a certain status. I want to remind you, you're no longer in those years, but what you are in is in the newness. And so many of us have those horrific replays of that newness, like, oh, I think I'm gonna choose the wrong thing instead of going back to that kindergarten time where everything was just brand new and adventure. I wanna leave you with this story. Uh, the other day I was visiting uh, San Diego. I just moved from San Diego, California to Las Vegas, Nevada, and I was walking out of a coffee shop. The weather was gorgeous. The breeze just felt like um, heaven on my skin. And there was a little boy that started screaming to his mother with delight, a bird, a bird. And I looked to see like, is this a hummingbird? Is this like a one of the most unique birds on the planet. Like, am I, do I need to get my Instagram moment out so that I can record this? Is all of TikTok gonna blow up because I captured it? And y'all, my Texan is coming out. Y'all, I turn and look, it's a regular black bird. But guess what? I asked his mom, I said, how old is he? And she said, he just turned two. I said, and he's this lit up about a bird. She said, yes. And I thought to myself, when was the last time I was that ecstatic that I saw a bird? When was the last time that I saw a lizard, a bug or whatever, like I did when I was a kid and like, OMG, it's faded, why? I see birds all the time. I normalized it in my reality. And now I've lost my sense of appreciation for something that a brand new soul is just like, this is amazing. I want to wow. invite you as an entrepreneur to, hey, Jackie, I'll wrap up this story and come back to you. I wanna invite you as an entrepreneur to just consider as you're learning, whether it's building a lead page, a website, speaking on stages for the first time, the mastery of TikTok or Instagram reels or writing a blog on LinkedIn, a blog, a blog, I did it, I did it. Remember you're evolving, you're expanding and you get to do it with delight but only if mm -hmm. you will learn how to shape your reality for more than misery and complexity, and instead for meaning and for the things that really bring you a sense of true peace and feeling like you matter in this world. Jackie? Alison, thank you so much. And everyone, we are so sorry for the tech issues. There's a blizzard all up there and uh, things just went down. So, so glad to be back. And thank you so much, Alison, for being so patient and sharing the most wonderful story. I really, really appreciate that. I was so enjoying our questions. And then, you know, technology, sometimes the world. Well, technology uh, is amazing when it works. But oh, here's the thing I that know, I right? want to say. You would yeah. not have a tech issue if you weren't doing something you'd never done before. So we get to say, a tech issue, a Yay! tech issue, we did it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take that for sure. We'll take that for sure. We had just finished with you starting to share really well about imposter syndrome. Um, and uh, the other part I wanted to, to maybe ask you and see if we can address it. We still have time given uh, we had a few technology challenges was, I feel like a lot of people getting into business want to get to the success section very, very quickly. And so start to compare them, their A to someone else's uh, C and D and Z. And then we keep feeling as though we're not getting to success because we're not seeing that success quickly. How did you navigate and how long did it take you from going, I can, from your mentor saying, you can do this, you can start now, 
to getting to a place where you're like, okay, you know what? I'm actually confident and this is my path and I'm going to take as long as it takes to get there because I mentor and coach a lot of people and I feel like sometimes I encounter some of us who are looking to see the success showing up quickly. I launched a website yesterday. Why do I have only two cells? And you're like, that's, that's right. You launched it yesterday. It takes a while to actually build. So how long did it take you to get from A to B and then B to K and then to where you are right now? Well, I think that the consciousness that I coach in today and the consciousness mm -hmm. that I had when I was living it are completely different. So mm -hmm. the consciousness that I had when I was living it, my success yeah. was always too small in my mind. I remember my first launch uh, to market was around $218,000, but I had been groomed right. by mentor that was making millions. And so I had relative deprivation. I thought that because she was making millions, I should be able to kind of borrow that success. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't real. Right. So no. in my mind, I was devastated. And in my mind, I was defeated. And this is mm -hmm. why I've written the frameworks that I have today, because I had to coach myself into a new reality. And what was right. the new reality? If I just try something I've never tried before, that has to count for something. Yes. And I believe that most entrepreneurs don't pay attention to the fact that they are not only building a business, but they are also leading a life. And I wasn't paying attention to, I was building my business and releasing weight off my body. I was building mm -hmm. a business, releasing weight off of my body and calling in a life partner. I was building right. a business, releasing weight off of my body and calling in a life partner and healing my relationship with my mother and my sister. Like all of those things are happening simultaneously. And we yes. really do think in our sweet little brains, that we have 100% of our time available to dedicate to just our vision. So I would mm -hmm. say uh, the consciousness that I had in the past is that 100% of you can go 100% to your vision, your business, your entrepreneurship. That's not accurate. Right. Where I coach and train and mentor and lead and guide today is to mm -hmm. segment. And the way that I suggest it is to draw a triangle and at the bottom of the yes. triangle, write two words, life provision. Those are the things that you want to do to just provide for yourself financially. What do you want to mm -hmm. do to just like to make money? To the right yes. of the triangle, write professional achievement. What are the things that you want to do that help you feel achieved professionally? And to the mm -hmm. left of the triangle, write personal fulfillment. What are the things that you want to do that help you feel personally fulfilled? So I may want to write a book as a professional achievement, but it's probably not going to make me any money in the short game. So then I'll know, all right, it's not my provider, but it is something that's going to help me feel achieved. And oh, by the way, if I'm dating and going out and traveling all over the globe in personal fulfillment, I now feel that I have holistic success within me, but I cannot right. feel that way. All I'm doing is ever paying attention to the bottom of the triangle, my life provision. I will feel like I'm constantly pursuing success. I won't trust myself to be significant. I'll continue to regurgitate strategies that will probably break down and I will abandon mm -hmm. my soul and probably not even want to exist on earth anymore. That's where we see a lot of entrepreneurs and CEOs and leaders that want to start committing death by suicide, want to start addictive habits uh, that really right. take them out of this life because this world of greatness can be overwhelming. And I'm very honest and transparent about that because we need to normalize these conversations of realness. Yeah, and mental health is such a huge element for us as you're trying to create success while dealing with regular life, just as you said. So that is so important. Mm -hmm. Alison, you're so inspiring. I wanna be your best friend. So, you know, how do we, how do the rest of us get in touch with you? With you? Like, how can anyone <laughs> get in touch with you? And That's are there other Alisons? Because I think all of us are gonna like, 
you know, 570 people registered for this. So 570 people are going to see this. And all of us are going to be like, we want to be Alison's best friend. How can we do that? <laughs> but okay, so let's take away the best friend part. You're too busy. You have too many people. Uh, how can people actually be, be in touch with you so, so we can continue to laugh? I really mean it about being your best friend. But uh, how can people actually get in touch with you uh, to just to learn more about, to see what else you're doing and, and to just to continue to get inspired? Is there a way people can reach oh, out to you? Thank you so much. Yes. So I have a really great passion project right now uh, in the mm -hmm. digital marketing space. Only 7% of the digital marketing world is identifying as black right now. And yes. I've created a new framework for belonging and how mm -hmm. all communities can center on blackness with love and acceptance. It's such a sweet project for me. I have been working with non-black leaders to bring it into their communities to really yeah. help them understand understand the intersectionality that if one group mm -hmm. is marginalized all groups are marginalized okay, okay. and so yeah. you can go to www.belongingwithlove three words belonging with love and download mm -hmm. my new framework um, that helps you have self accountability on what really matters in your heart and in your life to be inclusive and so i encourage you to download that also, if you follow me on Instagram, I'm a worthy follow. And if you tap my link in bio, I've got tons of free resources, podcasts, interviews. I am a vessel. I am a channel. I have always dreamt of being this person. And so it's a dream come true, Jackie, to sit with you, to share. Thank you, Candace, who brought me to this stage. Um, you know, I'm just over the moon. And I mean, even when we practiced and Andy was showing us this platform a week ago, I was just sitting there giddy, like, I'm so excited that I get to do this <laughs> and I get to be this person. And so I'm deeply grateful and I would love to stay connected. I am so thankful to you, Alison. I am supremely inspired. As I said at the beginning, we have people right now watching you from Africa, from England, from the US, from here. You've inspired so many of us and I can't tell you how thankful I am to just to get to be in the same space as you. I feel elevated just for that. And I'm sure all of us um, are watching you right now, feeling the same thing. Uh, in the chat, we've included all of those links. All of us are going to follow you and start to get more inspired. Thank you so much for being part of this. I'm sure we'll be in touch again. I'll be like, Alison, I did say I'm going to oh, reach thank out. You so, so thank you. Much. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Have, Have the most a wonderful day. day. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Guys, how, how amazing was that? It's just, it's the most amazing thing to be speaking to Alison. And now we're going to move on with the rest uh, of the day. Um, and I'm going to throw it off to our team uh, that are going to take it to the next part, which is, I think, into Cheska. And Cheska is going to introduce our, our videos, our pitch contest. Yay. Hi, everyone. As you all know, or as most of you know, we've launched our first ever nationwide black pitch contest. There were so many applicants and we've narrowed it down to our top 15 semi-finalists. We're going to share their brilliant ideas with you and we hope that you show them some love. First up, we have Micheline Kan of Althea Therapy. Hi everyone, my name is Micheline Kahn and I'm a scientist and founder of Althea Therapy an app to get access to culturally responsive mental health and wellness professionals in Canada. After witnessing the rise in rates of anti-Black racism and anti-Asian discrimination during the pandemic, I moved into the tech space to, to design a digital solution to address the lack of accessible and culturally responsive mental health services in the country. Since the pandemic, there's been a rise in rates of depression, generalized anxiety, and suicide across the board with higher rates among communities of color. What's more is that a recent survey found that 60% of black Canadians would be more willing to use mental health services if they had a black therapist. I soft launched our minimum viable product in April of 2021. I built the product lean using no code so that I could test the market. I currently have over 50 clinicians on the platform and growing with over 600 users. Here's how it works. You can use the search functionality to narrow down what kind of therapist you're looking for, 
send them a private message to request a session, and use our resources, including clinical definitions and workbooks for additional support. Based on our user surveys, we found that our community wanted more support from employers and over 60% of users were trying therapy for the first time. So we decided to partner with licensed therapists to develop a program with employers to address culturally informed wellness in the workplace. We're going to reinvent mental health support where diverse employers can see tremendous savings in mental health claims and provide the necessary support to underserved communities to elevate their lived identities. We developed, the, we developed the program content alongside licensed therapists earlier this year and are currently working with therapists to teach the program modules. We'll launch a pilot in early January of 2023 and iterate on the program before offering it to companies. So why us, why now? Althea Therapy already has a proven MVP in the market. Employees need mental health support that's inclusive, anti-oppressive, and science-backed. And since the pandemic, funding for health and wellness has skyrocketed. Thank you so much for your time. If you guys are in the East, so is Mikalid. Shut up, Ontario. We're going to keep things rolling on the East. Next up, we have Shanice and Shalisha, who have created Maison Sien, otherwise known as MO. Let's roll the clip. Hi, I'm Shanice and this is Shalisha, and we're social entrepreneurs and the co-founders of Maison Sam. Maison Sam, also known as Emo, is an online store born out of recognizing the lack of diversity in sustainable wellness and self-care products in the Canadian market. The idea, well, one of many, was simple, to promote local BIPOC brands that curate sustainable products both in their ingredient selection and in their packaging. But the journey has uncovered several gaps. Firstly, there are not many BIPOC brands in the Canadian markets place offering organic products. And secondly, many of those brands don't have sustainable packaging. Equally, we're little represented in major categories, whether that be oral care, feminine health, skincare for men, and the list goes on. This got us thinking, we need to be part of the solution, putting our efforts towards closing that gap. So fast forward a year in business and two pregnancies later, we've had this shift from self-care to needing community care and wanting to build on belonging, sharing experiences, having support both emotionally and physically, and launching our very own product line to address the lack of diversity and accessibility to sustainably made products in the Canadian market would be a great start. Winning 25K would be huge for us. It would help us to expand our business, starting with R&D. We'd be able to develop our own products, focusing on women health and perinatal care while simultaneously educating our community by hosting events and leading workshops on the importance of health, specifically pregnancy health and postpartum care. So our vision is to rent and create a haven known as Open Wealth. Uh, to welcome and nurture BIPOC families and giving them access to information, intentional connection, and organic products for their community needs. Thank you so much for this opportunity. We're just one step closer to realizing our goal. As, Shalice and, as Shalisha and Shanice mentioned, the grand prize is 25K. Let's see how Tywo McGregor, who created VestaChat, plans to use that if you want as his brilliant idea. Hello? Hi, John. I'm calling to let you know your appointment at the hearing clinic is tomorrow at 1 p.m. Huh? Did you say 3 p.m. today? No, I said 1 p.m. tomorrow. Oh, okay. See you at 5. <laughs> Did you know that the primary method of communication between hearing loss clinics and their patients is phone calls? The problem is phone calls don't always work. The alternatives are communicating through another family member, TTY numbers, email, some receptionists use their personal cell phone, or the clinic may go with an expensive and inconvenient to use business cell phone. There has to be a better way, right? That's a chat we offer an affordable to use web application that allows hearing loss clinics to communicate with their patients via text messaging. Instead of a phone call, John can text the clinic. Hi there, it's John James. Is my appointment today at five or tomorrow at one? The clinic would reply, hi John, my appointment is tomorrow at one. See you then. Our solution allows the clinic 
to text from a website versus a phone, we can convert an existing voice-only business landline and make it text capable. We do group text messaging. We offer an uh, auto reply feature. We do all this at an affordable price. We're a B2B company with two revenue streams. We charge a clinic $5 a month to host our number and each message costs two cents. For a clinic that uses about 20 messages a day, it would cost them about $17 a month. As far as our go-to-market strategy, we're currently focused on hearing clinics in the GTA. Next, we will roll out to health, all healthcare practices in Canada, dentists, chiropractors, hospitals, etc. We will then grow by expanding our offering to Canadian companies outside of the healthcare sector. We're then going to scale up by allowing over 100 million businesses globally to use our service, services. This represents a $6 billion ARR market opportunity. My name is Tywo McGregor. I'm the founder, CEO, and CTO of VestaChat. Anna is my marketing intern from York University. David is my marketing advisor. He has 20 plus years of marketing experience. And Jeffrey Podvan is my mentor. He's a serial entrepreneur and an angel investor, as well as a founder of OPN and Pitchit. The underlying problem is that phone calls don't always work. We've identified a clear need, a gap in the market. We have an MVP and a few paying customers. Uh, since, leaving the, since leaving the DMZ's BIF bootcamp, uh, we've added two new customers. And with this $20,000 grant, we would be able to make enhancements to the product as well as add 30 new customers before the end of the year. We'd love to continue working with the DMZ for mentorship, networking opportunities. Thank you. All right. So up next, we have Kay St. Kitts. She's a creative from Scarborough, and she created all these gifts. Um, it's very exciting because her creativity and art is on a whole nother level. So let's see what new gift has to offer. My name is Casey Kitts, and I am the proud founder of New Gift. Before we get into New Gift and how it's flipped the sustainability world on its head, I'd like for us to get to know each other a little bit better. I'm a multidisciplinary artist. I'm a seasoned wardrobe stylist that has been working in the industry for over a decade. During my six years in LA, I simultaneously had one foot in the fashion world and had the other in the floral industry. I would work for one of the most elite floral services in the world. I also dibbled and dabbled in a lot of interior decorating. To sum it up, I have a way of making things beautiful wherever I go. And while using my knowledge, I started to create something new and beautiful. New Gift Custom Art and Decor specializes in one-of-a-kind, completely customized art pieces made from sustainable materials. Using discarded textiles like denim, cotton, polyester, spandex, wood, plastic, the list goes on. With art as the vehicle, I found a new way to breathe life into discarded textiles and materials. Being in the fashion world, it's hard to turn a blind eye to the damage that occurs from the production of merchandise. New Gift is my fresh perspective on approachable art. Within a year of launching, I brought my sustainable practices to the classroom. I then launched in-store at Makeway, Canada's first woman-owned sneaker boutique. I think it's safe to say that New Gift has created a buzz. It's time to bring this impact to a larger audience. Environmental issues and sustainability is something that affects all of us. Our environment is something we're fighting for, and I've just found a creative way to do it. The rest of the world needs to know what New Gift is doing because it's never been done. By creating sustainable art pieces and installations, we can continue to change the world one art piece at a time. And just like that, we are down to our last, well, out of the top 15, we have five videos right now, but we'd like to welcome the rest Ashkadam of Vastrap. We're going to throw it back to the west side and head over to Vancouver, BC and see what he's all about. Hi, my name is Duras Ashkadam. I'm the founder and CEO of Vastr. I was born in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. I'm a first generation immigrant and I'm really excited to share with you the story of Vastr. Vastr is a mobile application that provides cannabis product information in real time, where Shazam uses the phone's microphone to identify music around you. Vaster uses the camera to help you explore information about consumer packaged goods. 
Using machine learning built into the app, users can point their mobile camera at physical products to uncover AI-driven, personalized data associated with each item. The app is designed to provide users with information such as the effects of usage, recommended application of product, dosage recommendations, and possible side effects. Our purpose is to provide technology that helps consumers make informed decisions. We use AI and anonymized personal data to deliver a bespoke customer experience that reflects the user's preferences and guides them to better experiences. We operate with integrity and respect to personal data and privacy, recognizing the sensitivity of people's personal experiences with cannabis. The application is designed to help licensed producers and dispensaries educate and empower their customers to make informed choices. We've already deployed the beta version of the application and plan a full release in the first quarter of 2023. As a Black-owned business, spearheading the delivery of platform infrastructure to the cannabis industry, which has previously criminalized Black and minority participation in particular, is an important motivator for our ambition in this space. As a platform provider, we'd be well positioned to underpin the industry at scale. Thank you for your time. And those were just five out of our top 15 semifinalists. So stay tuned and make sure you show them some love. I'm going to throw it back to Jordan and Wasim. And yeah, excited. Awesome. Thank you so much, Cheska, for that breakdown. And if you have been following us up until this point, you probably have been just absorbing a lot of information. So what we're going to do is we're going to give you an opportunity just to take a quick break. But before that, we're just going to shoot over to FA. She's going to do a quick poll um, and survey with you guys. And then we will take a short break after that. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I just wanted to quickly mention to say, please don't forget to complete the survey that is in the poll and help us gather the feedback that is needed as this is really important to us. And we want you to remember that by adding your feedback, it really helps us continue to impact and make more progress in the work that you are doing in your community. So please complete the poll and keep on using that poll throughout the day as well as the questionnaire. Thank you guys so much. And we're gonna take a break and we'll see you very shortly. Hey everyone, welcome back to the BEBC black business summit 2023 it's so exciting having you all here we've got so many of you online already um right now i think we have people from kenya from nigeria uh from uk from the us and local uh all of canada it's just it's amazing having all of you here and i'm just so proud to be presenting i'm gonna be talking to it's an amazing uh, group we've got uh, and we're going to be talking about working with lending institutions you know how to help uh, scale and grow our businesses we know without funding we can't do it so we're going to be talking to the people who actually are working in there to tell us a little bit more about what the status is right now so i'd love to introduce to you um, the panel coming up and i'll start with Jamal Rutherford from BDC. Uh, Jamal is an experienced commercial lending professional, exceptionally motivated leader with over 15 years working in commercial banking and um, business development and telecommunications. He has worked at BDC for over 10 years where he has rapidly progressed through roles in small business, mid-market, regional strategy, and now leads uh, BDC's small business team in the greater Toronto area. So he's the founding member of Black Professional Network at BDC, which is important for us. And he's providing Black professionals with tools, guidance, connections to thrive within the organization, as well as helping us who need to go to BDC um, for support as well. So Jamal holds an MBA in technology and innovation from Ted Rogers School of Management and a bachelor's degree in business economics from York University. Welcome, Jamal. Good to have you here. Thank you, Jackie. And then we're going to have Clifton. Uh, he hasn't joined us yet, but Clifton is from TD. And his parents are uh, originally from Jamaica. He grew up in the GTA. And uh, he's increasingly senior position supporting TD's diversity and inclusion mandates, spearheading customer and employee and, and community portfolios. He has an experience 
intensive experience uh, in the black community and has been instrumental in helping TD become a leader in the community. And as you all know, TD just launched uh, a new black business loan program. He holds an undergraduate degree in political science from York University and an MBA from University of Guelph. And he's currently the national manager um, black community business development. His goal, of course, is to deliver the whole bank to the black community while providing elevated advice and customer experience. And so on the side of his desk is an employee management, uh, sorry, employee engagement core leader for TD's Black Employee Network with a mandate to, pro to promote awareness and enhance uh, their employee experience. So he's a great advocate for promoting mental health, wellness, and he loves politics. So Clinton will be with us shortly, and we're excited to have him. So welcome, Clinton. And then we've got Tiffany. Tiffany was here last year, and you all know Tiffany is doing an amazing job at FACE. She's the co-founder and inaugural CEO of the Federal of African Canadian Economics, which we all know as FACE, which we all engage with. And she's just, she's an amazing person. She's a former executive director of Cote Neige Black Community Association, which I ruined the name and I apologize. One of the oldest black community organizations in Quebec. Her latest projects include helping engineer the first digital platform collecting race-based data in the history of Canada, supported by McGill University, and we all know data is king, so that work is important. The research is uh, published on the platforms use, using, um, sorry, during COVID pandemic was published by Bristol University in 2022. Uh, she's the co-lead of a pan-Canadian strategic advisory committee that raised the largest amount of public funds for black Canadians in the history of the country to support black entrepreneurs. And she's a key advisor on the development of the strongest AI power digital tool uh, to source public funds and employment for, uh, for the benefit of black, of black Canadians. It's amazing, the better will be coming soon. I can't wait to engage with that. And she's the founder of an edutech company that aims to support parents with preschool and primary school students from language minority communities to succeed in the French school system. Welcome, Tiffany. I'm so glad to have you again this year. And then we have an important group that just started uh, in the last year. It's called Investment BC, and this is such an important group. And we've got Leah here, Leah Nguyen, and Leah is the inaugural CIO in, uh, in BC, a strategic investment fund with 500 million to invest in companies in companies and funds to generate financial returns and achieve social, economic, and environmental impact for BC. As a CIO, Leah, Leah leads the development of and its execution uh, of the investment strategy to deliver on NBC's triple bottom line. Um, approach of investment uh, in people, planet, and profit, which is so key for us, especially as black entrepreneurs. So prior to being in BC, Leah was an investment director at TELUS, uh, for, uh, Pollinator Fund for Good, one of the world's largest corporate uh, impact funds, uh, where she led uh, sourcing, ele evaluating, and executing investment opportunities aligned with the funds. And Leah has experience building high-performing, mission-driven teams that leverage technology and innovation to drive sustainable, inclusive uh, solutions and deliver remarkable human outcomes. I am so glad to be talking with you, Leah. I've talked with you before. I'm so glad to have you on this pan panel. Lastly, we have Puneet Jain uh, from Van City. He has a great background uh, in finance and law. He's been at Van City for 13 years. And I personally knew Puneet because Puneet gave me the very first ever loan I ever qualified for, and he's been an ally, uh, and he understands our community and business so well. So just very glad to have everyone on this panel. Clifton will join us a little bit later. He's having technical issues, but he'll come in. But so far, thanks, guys. Welcome. I'm so glad to have you all. Excellent. So we'll just go right into our Q&A. Give me just one second, guys, and I will pull it up. So last year when we were here, we talked a lot um, about, about accessing funding in the Black community. You all being here 
know that that's one of our biggest hurdles as uh, as black entrepreneurs i mean it's true of small businesses anyways but very true of the black uh, community and so we started the conversation last year of going what is the landscape right now and so what i'd like i'd love to learn from each of you and from your own organizations what would you say has changed systematically since COVID, especially in the last year in your organization with regards to supports and access to funding entrepreneurs start with you tiffany Sure, thank you so much, Jackie. Uh, nice to see you again. I hope, can everybody hear me? No? Yes? Oh, everybody else can hear me, Jackie. But I'm saying hello, Jackie. Hello to BBC and our wonderful panel. I'm so glad to join you today. So to your point, Jackie, I think that a lot of things have changed since the pandemic. I can say that our organization, uh, the Federation of African Canadian Economics, actually began and started during the pandemic. Um, but I think that it was uh, the opportunity for society in our isolation to kind of do an introspective look at who we are and what we consider as necessary access for all Canadians to thrive and to be able to advance in this society. So mm -hmm. our organization yeah. in regards to uh, how it changed our, 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 our service delivery, our way in which we would engage and support black entrepreneurs is very quite simple. By looking at the emergency um, services that were being offered by the federal government, the Canadian emergency respective leaders across the country, including myself, took an in-depth look at what the criteria would be and what we thought would be the impact or the, the lack of access that might be created through that program for Black entrepreneurs. And in its best form, we're able to engage Black business owners who are looking down the barrel of this pandemic and not knowing how their businesses would survive. We were able to speak to each other across the country to see if we had uh, a similar intuition that this program might not reach our black businesses in our respective communities. And we're able to mobilize mm -hmm. and engage government to have a great conversation, an important conversation, and begin to develop and co-design what a solution could look like that is above and beyond COVID-19, but to resolve a longstanding issue of access to capital for black entrepreneurs. So I think that's what changed. We were in a pandemic, we were isolated from each other, but it gave us a chance to reflect on life as it was and what could it look like going forward. Amazing. Thank you so much, Tiffany. Tiffany, how, what would you say, Jamal, from your organization? And again, thank you, Jackie. And uh, really a pleasure to be, to, to be with you all this afternoon. In terms of uh, changes that I've seen, uh, particularly since COVID, um, I would say the awareness, knowledge, and I think commitment um, uh, really around uh, supporting um, uh, entrepreneurs, particularly those from diverse backgrounds has certainly changed. Um, in terms of, uh, in terms of the, the awareness, the knowledge and commitment that I'm referring to though, I don't think it's necessarily related uh, to the pandemic per se in terms of timelines. I think the timelines are certainly similar. Uh, from my perspective, yeah. uh, following the, the assassination of George Floyd, I think we saw a huge increase in the education yes. and commitment uh, to, um, you know, particularly to anti-Black uh, systemic racism and, and, um, and discussions around the Black experience. Uh, this led, mm -hmm. um, what I've seen, and I think we've all seen, uh, a, a big shift, in, particularly with the banks and particularly with the corporate, um, uh, um, large corporations as well. I read an article, I think it was a few weeks ago from Forbes, and they were keeping track. And, I, and what they found was um, they noted that we're about 44 of 50 of the largest publicly traded companies in the U.S. They made commitments uh, in and around the, uh, the, the, the dollar amount of about $50 billion. Uh, and that would have include yeah. like the notables like Facebook. I think uh, they essentially um, uh, had, uh, had uh, committed about $10 million for racial justice. Apple had committed committed an additional $100 million and Google with about $370 million. So certainly I would say one of the first things was really going to be around awareness, knowledge, and commitment. Um, the next piece um, I, I would say is, is certainly the economy. And I think more recently, uh, what we've all been, uh, been, been, been dealing with, and, and we all look at the news and we're all talking about it, is specifically economic downturn. And I think that's putting a lot more pressure on business owners, um, uh, you know, and, and, you know, them needing to do uh, quite a bit more with less, um, to, be, to be quite frank, uh, and more pressure on profits, more pressure on cost cutting. I think we've seen, um, you know, I think we've seen the realities in the grocery store, obviously, uh, and, and, and we see where the realities in terms of, um, you know, the cost of, uh, you know, the products and, and the services that we consume. The next year that I mm -hmm. think um, uh, there was a significant change 
Um, of the few positives that came out of COVID, I would say that um, around digital and the need to digitize your business, uh, I think that's become a big priority for a number of uh, a number of business owners. And finding ways to sell online to reach more customers, finding efficiencies to uh, to reduce costs, um, to find efficiencies to better deliver a, a better customer experience, that's been certainly a big piece. And I know the Canadian government has been um, a, a pretty um, a committed to this specific focus uh, with programs like the, the CDAP program, the Canadian Digital Adoption Program, right? Uh, and then finally, I would say there has been an increased conversation around sustainability. And, um, you, know, you know, so as far as the market, as far as social and environmental forces, uh, these are accelerating um, the, the discussion around sustainability. I think putting a lot of pressure on businesses to change. There are some discussions, a lot of discussions right now happening around ESG. I believe it is still being uh, being flushed out as to exactly what that means for small business. Uh, but really amongst yeah. that, I think, you know, embracing sustainability, um, you know, certainly leads to higher profits, more engaged staff, happy customers and cost savings. Uh, it's obviously helpful in terms of, um, you know, it requires you to consider the needs of all stakeholders. And really, I think I think big or small uh, businesses, um, uh, you know, the business values themselves matter. So, you know, even for us as consumers, mm -hmm. we're always conscious in terms of what some of the values of some of the, the organizations we work with, um, you know, what those would look like. So in terms of changes, again, like I say, like I said, I think certainly a big change around awareness and commitment. Um, the economy, I think we have to deal with that. Uh, this commitment to digital, and the discussion we're having right now around sustainability, I think those are some of the changes that I've seen since uh, since COVID. Amazing, thank you so much, Jamal. Uh, Puneet, uh, how has thing how have things changed at Van City in terms of um, of serving Black businesses? Uh, thank you, Jackie. I concur with uh, Tiffany and Jamal. Uh, really great points mm -hmm. uh, on the current uh, update and pulse check. Um, I work with Vansity. I have been working with Vansity for almost 13 years. And in my time, um, Vansity has a great program, which is financial inclusion is at its core. And due to that core value, um, mm -hmm. Vansity has been doing a program called microfinance since 2002. And with, the, with awareness of this black entrepreneur program, we were able to implement out of the box thinking, implement more deep conversations with small businesses in the lower mainland of BC. And what we've uncovered is that there's a lot of, um, um, like the small business owner is not aware of the options that they might have. Um, so, mm -hmm. and that, uh, because of that awareness, they are willing to take that chance. And that's, I think is a radical change in the community, which is, which is gonna motivate all the small business owners to, you know, let's, let me take that chance and let me unlock mm -hmm. more capital. So I think that's that's right. what I've seen. Excellent, thank you so much, Puneet. Leah, um, your organization has just come up and you're towards uh, venture and investing into the community. Um, I'm, I'm really curious to hear about InvestBC and, and the outlook you have in terms of, of either direct investment or um, or investing in the do direct investing, uh, because you will, you won't be able to answer the same question that Tiffany and Jamal and Punit answered because you, yours is slightly separate. So I want to give you a, a ramp to be able to answer it in the way that makes sense for Invest BC. Thanks for that, Jackie. I actually do think that there are origins that came from COVID, though. So the mm -hmm. um, our former premier John Horgan. Um, announced the Stronger BC Economic Recovery Plan in 2020 in the midst of COVID. And one of the big pillars around that was, how do we build back better for BC? Recognizing the impacts of the pandemic, not just from a health perspective, but also from you know, a social perspective, a lot of the challenges within our economy and, and how do we build a more resilient economy? And so as a part of that, um, through the Stronger BC Economic Recovery Plan in BC was announced, mm -hmm. uh, the formation of us, with the mandate that we look at how do we build a more prosperous, inclusive and sustainable future for BC, right? And so while right. we didn't exist in that time, the origins of it stem from that, right? And I think it's deeply rooted in everything that the, the panel here has said, right? Is I think this right. 
global and 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 I guess, I, I guess our case provincial awareness that we need to think about how do we do business in a way and invest in businesses mm -hmm. that build that into the core of how they operate and um and so I think that's what I think is really exciting about what we do is that the legislation actually says we have a triple bottom line mandate, right? And so we think mm -hmm. about that really thoughtfully in terms of how we've built our organization, but how do we also think about who we invest in? How do we screen for those opportunities, right? And how do we help move the needle in embedding this so that it's part of business as usual, not a niche area of investment, right? When we think about the statistics, the, the the needles has not moved significantly when it comes to funding, uh, venture funding for entrepreneurs of color or for women entrepreneurs or the intersectionality of both, right? Like statistics, you know, mm -hmm. still are not great. That's an opportunity where we come in, where we're not just backing more businesses, but how do we invest in more fund managers that will embed those values and be able to cascade those forward, right? Um, so with NBC, we have four impact objectives. Um, one is around driving climate action. Another is around innovating for the future. So how do we help to diversify our economy so that you know we are a very resource-based economy? resilient mm -hmm. economy for BC. Um, the other two areas of impact are around advancing reconciliation, which I think for all of us here in Canada, and I'm fortunate to and work and play on the traditional unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, um, Squamish, Musqueam, and Salatooth here in Burnaby. Um, but we, there's a big role that we still have to play from a reconciliation perspective and how do we help to drive economic reconciliation. And then the final is elevating inclusive communities. So not just how do we invest in more diverse founders, but how do we invest in more diverse and inclusive solutions, right? Um, so that we're building solutions that help everybody, right? And not just the top 1%, right? So those are really core to how we look at evaluating funds as well as companies um, in terms of you know, one, how do they say they do this? But two, how do they measure for that, right? Um, and mm -hmm. I think, Jamal, you, you made that brief comment about like ESG and how do we pass greenwashing, right? So that that's a really critical part of how we look um, at every investment, right? And so with that goal of really driving better outcomes, just in who we back, but the solutions more broadly so that they're, they're helping create a more inclusive, sustainable and prosperous uh, province for us. So true. Thank you so much, Leah. So last time, last year when we had this conversation, it was close to the beginning of many of these black funding programs coming up. And so I want to try and see if we can celebrate some of the successes so far. So can we say access to funding truly has improved for black entrepreneurs? And if we say that, what are the numbers? Like, what have you seen? Like, Tiffany, I know you have a really good story to share about the numbers of people that have already uh, received funding. Um, and for Jamal and Puneet, I'd love to know what, what actual different funding um, types uh, exist right now in your organizations that people should know. As you all said, one of the most important things is awareness. And we realize in the black community, there was very little awareness about the programs that were available. Even when FACE came, uh, we knew that there was FACE, but we didn't have a complete good knowledge about, about uh, how it was working and the different programs that BDC or TD or, or, or uh, Van City has. So is it possible for you to share some numbers so we can all celebrate about all the all the good stuff that has already gone ahead and maybe highlight as well what programs are existing so that we can use the 570 people that registered for the event to actually know this so that we're increasing awareness on the programs available i think i'll start with you tiffany okay sure great well i i get the the good fortune of saying that i'm partnered with uh, three people on this, three organizations on this panel. So yeah. with the BDC, with TD, and with Van City, Leo, we probably should yeah. talk at some point. But um, ultimately, the, the the advantage, and I think that your question is pertinent. Um, I think things have improved for Black entrepreneurs to be able to have access to capital. I think the more doors that entrepreneurs can go through to get support mm -hmm. is very important. And I think that that was the genesis yeah. and the idea of having this conversation with government and their response to create mm -hmm. the Black Entrepreneurship Program which houses the Black Entrepreneurship Loan Fund uh, that FACE administered is a part of that. So I think that there is growth and opportunity there. Um, to date, if we're gonna celebrate numbers, um, ultimately uh, FACE um, closing its Q3 
um, soon we'll get to be able to say what we've done for the year, um, year to, or I guess you'd say year to date or program to date since we launched in May 2021 has approved uh, 30, $33.4 million in loans across the country. And notably, we're also in 12 of 13 jurisdictions. That means the coast to coast to coast is almost there, which is also important to note. Mm -hmm. um, and that means in terms of disbursements, because as we work with our partners and able to support entrepreneurs um, end to end, uh, that represents um, a large number of businesses too. I think I like celebrating that as well. How many companies have we touched? And that represents uh, 370 businesses, black owned businesses across the country. So this is uh, mm -hmm. great traction. Um, and I'm glad to have partners that support uh, in, this, in this initiative as it grows and we are able to provide access for more Black entrepreneurs. Excellent. Jomal and Puneet, are there any numbers you can share that are independent uh, in your organization saying this is the number of Black businesses that have been supported or is it in conjunction with what Tiffany has already shared and that would be sufficient if that's the case? Yeah, and I, I, I can go first. And um, uh, I, I do apologize. I do not have the numbers uh, um, uh, at hand right now in terms of uh, in terms of the, the black businesses that BDC has actually supported year to date. I, it, you know, it certainly continues to, be, um, you know, to um, to Tiffany's point uh, uh, earlier, and, and I guess to your question, has funding actually improved for black entrepreneurs? I think the the answer mm -hmm. is absolutely yes. And um, but I, I you know I, I would say that uh, I still believe that there is some still some work to do. Uh, you know, Panit yeah. had mentioned a little bit earlier that um, in terms of awareness of some of the programs, it is still you know still something that we are uh, we all all are all are all working on. Uh, currently, mm -hmm. um, BDC, you know, as, as Canada's development bank, I, I think our initial approach was uh, to look at partnerships. So, you know, part the partnership that we have with FACE is one that we are really, really, really proud of, and uh, will continue to sue, uh, you know, uh, to support. There are a number of other organizations as well that you know that um, that we do recognize as as key players within, uh, you know, within the marketplace. Um, you know, you know that 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 um, that we have partnered with. Uh, so, you know, for example, the Canadian Black Chamber, Chamber of Commerce, uh, you know, the Black Business. Association of British uh, British Columbia uh, and a number a number of other organizations, but really from 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 our vantage point, you know, when we look at uh, you know supporting on, on on the served entrepreneurs, it is still a very key part of our mandate. But we do recognize that there's still some work uh, you know that uh, that actually needs to be done. Some of the programs, though, you know that um, that uh, that I think you know for folks that are on the call. Uh, you know, um, uh, could actually benefit from in addition to uh, the Black Entrepreneur Fund, you know, that's uh, that's being administered and supported by FACE. Uh, one of our partners, Futurepreneur Canada, um, does offer a Black Entrepreneur, does offer a Black Entrepreneur Startup Program that provides entrepreneurs between 18 and 39 up to $60,000 in startup loan financing. Um, and also, in addition, like one of the things I really uh, like about Futurepreneur's program is that they, they essentially pair that financing, particularly for startups, with mentorship as well. Right. Because oftentimes, you know, that that's, you know, it, 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 it's, it's money, you know, and the financing can be one part of it. But sometimes there's a bit of a gap right. in terms of know how around different functional aspects of a business, whether it be, you know, sales and marketing or financial management or whatnot. Um, uh, and, and of course, you know, Tiffany talked about, you know, the support that uh, the face is actually providing um, alternative savings, for example. Um, again, they, they also have a microfinance program uh, where I believe they, you, can, you can get access to up to $50,000 in Ontario. I believe that's an Ontario program only right now. Um, uh, but again, there are a number of other organizations that are doing some incredible, incredible work. Our stance right now is, mm -hmm. is certainly around uh, focusing on partnerships uh, because we do believe yeah. many of these organizations are certainly uh, very close uh, you know, you know, to um, uh, and, and, and can really add a, a tremendous amount of, of, of value to um uh to not only the discussion but i think the execution of getting these programs directly and in front of uh, uh the entrepreneurs that actually need them mm -hmm. that's great puneet uh any new programs uh that people should know about specifically advanced city for funding um yeah thanks jackie it's um it's a microfinance program that Bantity has um had it since 2002 and um uh, I'm proud to celebrate that um, eight out of 10 uh, black entrepreneurs have succeeded in getting some financing from Ban City in the lower mainland of BC. So I'm really proud to um, like celebrate that. And it's, it's, it's just the conversations are opening up right now. Before they were not. 
And now with the support from organizations like Jackie's and BDABC, what they do is they, they look at the applicant and they send us an email, introduction email. And it's, it's, it's a really good touch point where the applicant is like not shy of opening up and really like, okay, this is what I'm thinking, Puneet, how do we make that happen? So it's, it's mm -hmm. the conversations that are happening much more than before. That's what I really celebrate. That's amazing. And I think uh, we need to further on that point. And this is a question that I'm going to have both for BDC and for Tiffany. Um, is the wraparound service. What I've found as we've served black businesses is the readiness before going to ask for a loan. So a lot of no's happen not because they can't afford uh, to be given a loan, but because the documentation and all of that good stuff is not ready. So there's a huge need in our community, as we've known, uh, for the wraparound service before we, we go to the bank. So we do that with Van City, where we get people ready, and then when they go to the bank, Punit is much more, and his team are much more likely to say yes to the loan than not. So, um, if, uh, Tiffany, I think you're doing the same thing as well. Are you able to share a little bit more about that process with FACE? And then, uh, Jamal, uh, if, you, if there is one that exists as well with BDC, we can share that just as an education point for everyone who's watching today to go, this is what you can do so that you're more likely to get a yes at the bank instead of a no. Well, yes, thank you. I can share that. Yes, uh, readiness has been is something that is very important and our, our entrepreneurs need to be accompanied before uh, they apply for funding and then also as well, I think after the financing as well. And this is what makes organizations yes. um, that are regionally uh, engaged with community and that organ and that uh, businesses can find such as BEBC as well as BBABC to be able to get that support through the entire entrepreneurial journey while they hit milestones. And one of the milestones yeah. is being financed. Um, we don't mm -hmm. offer that support in space, but we uh, ensure that we act as a bridge to be able to create uh, opportunities for information to be disseminated, connecting to professional uh, services, as well as organizations who are able to help with that journey to being financed. Um, one of the announcements that we had recently, along with TD uh, Ready Commitment, who have supported a new initiative that will launch from FACE uh, in April, mm -hmm. and that is the Propelling yes. Black Entrepreneurship Program. And the idea is to um, ensure that we continue to act as a bridge to connect Black entrepreneurs to the necessary resources mm -hmm. to increase their likelihood or their preparation to be able to apply for financing. And we're committed to ensuring that we continue to innovate with organizations like yourself and those across the country to make sure that the access not only to capital, but access to information and best practices is readily available for Black entrepreneurs. That's amazing. Thank you. And Tiffany, you guys are doing an amazing job. I can't tell you how proud we are of that. Uh, Jomal, how does the wraparound program or service look like at BDC, if there's one? And then the second question I have for you with regards to BDC, you have an amazing process where someone can apply for loans directly uh, online, which is great. Um, received a few questions on is that the only way you can do it but that's not true so I, I'd like for you to illuminate for anyone watching going here are the processes you can uh, you can reach through uh, for BDC so apply through face because through face you can then go through to BDC or if there's any other processes that they can go through and what are the possibilities of the wraparound just for people to be able to understand what is properly needed so that the process isn't too long when they come into BDC or you're sending them back going, this documentation isn't ready. Okay, so uh, I'll comment on the uh, on the process piece first, um, uh, you right. know, you know, in terms of uh, in terms of, you know, the processes that are available. So it is true. Yes. So we do certainly have our online uh, loan application process uh, that if you are an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. if, if you've been in business for, you know, two years plus, uh, you can certainly go online and apply to BDC for financing up to one hundred thousand uh, dollars, you know, and, and, and again, that's that's a process that's, you know, that I manage currently um, here in the GTA West, mm -hmm. we're roughly a team of, uh, of, of 10 individuals. Uh, these are folks that are out in the market building 
building relationships. So certainly an entrepreneur, uh, you know, you know, can certainly connect up with us directly to have a conversation, depending on where mm -hmm. they are in terms of their business journey, whether they are a startup or, or perhaps maybe, you know, a, a slightly more established business. Right. So, so, you know, so there's, there's certainly a number of different ways to actually engage, uh, you know, with, uh, with BDC either, you know, obviously through our online portal, um, you know, certainly connecting up, you know, with the account managers on my team directly or connecting up, you know, with, uh, you know, with our partners, uh, you know, you know, you know, such as face, right. So quite a number of different mm -hmm. ways of actually connect. And we are very, very keen those, uh, those conversations. I can tell you that with certainty. Um, now, when it comes to this topic of readiness, um, you've touched on something that's, um, a bit of a uh, it, it, it's a bit of a bit of a personal piece for me because I've so I've been at BDC for the better part of um, in excess of eleven years, and um, this mm -hmm. is one of the big challenges that I do see uh, particularly um, with uh, Black entrepreneurs when they do approach the bank uh, for. I'll share a few, mm -hmm. a few, a few, a few tips and tricks really from my perspective. Um, so mm -hmm. when it comes to approaching the bank, I think I think if you are a startup business, there's really two pieces that actually really go hand in hand. Um, so certainly ensuring that you have a business plan that clearly articulates that, you know, you know, exactly the, the, the nature of the venture that you're actually going to be uh, entering into mm -hmm. and really speaking to, you know, the credibility that you're bringing uh, to the table. So whether that be perhaps maybe some experience right. or something else, you know, that, that really is going to contribute to the success of, you know, of, of that project. That business plan obviously does need to include a, you know, a clear breakdown of if, you know, if the project itself is going to be, it is going to require X number of dollars of funding. Here's essentially what the breakdown of, is of the use mm -hmm. of that funding. And here's how much uh, capital that, you know, I would like to contribute or you'd like to contribute to, uh, you know, to, right. to, the, to the actual project. Um, particularly, again, if you're a startup uh, um, operation, typically for an existing business, we look at financial statements so we can go back and look at the capacity of that business to actually support the loan. But in the case of a startup, we do actually have to rely more so on forecasts. So ensuring that, you know, you know, at the outset, um, you know, uh, putting together a, a good business plan, putting together some financial projections and, and in terms of uh, in terms of guidance around doing so, I know there are a number of organizations that actually do provide that support, but BDC, um, even through our online resources, we have a number of templates that will take you through step by step as far as building a business plan and building financial projections. Mm -hmm. Our partners at Futurepreneur, they've got, um, they've recently revamped theirs as well. And again, if I were a new entrepreneur right now, uh, that would certainly be one of the tools that I that I that I should be um, uh, be, be be looking at. In terms of other aspects, mm -hmm. um, you know that, um, and again, like I said, this is a bit of a personal piece for me around this readiness uh, uh, discussion. Um, uh, I think I think around um, your credit history, and this is I'm working with uh, my marketing team right now, just around some articles uh, and some resources specifically around this. But I think um, ensuring that you have an awareness as to exactly what your credit, your personal credit history, your personal credit file looks like, uh, and again, if there are challenges, I think being very upfront. Uh, with the banker as to exactly the nature of those challenges, I think I think that that really helps uh, you know bankers like myself to be able to you know get ahead of certain things and and really uh, better better understand and better position uh, your loan application for success. Um, and 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 Panit, I, I know Panit is gonna is, is gonna agree to agree to me agree with this is each bank and regardless of the size, regardless of the um, uh, you know, uh, of, the, of the amount of, of finance that you're applying for, there is something that we all sort of rely on. There's a foundational piece that's referred to as the five C's of credit. And when it comes to, for example, when it comes to um, challenges around uh, credit history, which, which is the character component of the five C's of credit, if there are challenges there, usually my recommendation to entrepreneurs is ensure that the other C's are really, really well, um, uh, really well articulated. So, for example, mm -hmm. your capacity to actually service the loan, right? Um, you know what capital you're actually contributing to the project. So, for example, if you know the project costs X number of dollars, you ensuring that you're saying I'm coming to the table with X number of dollars. All of these things help to de-risk the, the the transaction, right? So, and again, um, I, I know I shared a lot there, but this is one this readiness piece. I'm telling you, it, it's it's it, it, it's it's really really personal for me, 
Um, uh, yeah. But and again, I'd encourage if, if anyone has any questions, please feel to reach out to me. But do certainly utilize the resources that are on the BDC.ca website. We spend a lot of time putting together some resources there, but also our partners do as well. The folks at Futurepreneur, yeah. uh, the team at Face have done an incredible job um, uh, in this ready on this topic of readiness. I'll just echo everything that Jamal said, because that's exactly what Tiffany would say. That's exactly what Punit would say in terms of becoming ready before you go to, the, to their groups for funding. And it's entirely because of that reason and our own personal experiences that BEBC has a wraparound service. And so we've been working really closely with Punit and we will send people to FACE and send people to BDC. But what we do is actually prepare people so those tools exist and they're readily available but we found that people feel really overwhelmed so someone who's never done a business plan before cash flow projections or income statements they can understand what you're saying but it's so difficult so some of them we actually have to handhold all the way through step by step building the thing and so people can go to bebc.org and they can actually book a meeting with us so we can start to walk them through the process and then maybe Joma, what i'll do once we are done with the summit is reach out to you so we can have a direct contact the same way we have with punit and his team so when we prepare people that we are sending you away we're sending to tiffany's way um that they're more likely for tiffany's group to have an easier time to saying yes because i'm sure tiffany you probably might share this is you've seen a lot of applications but many of them will not and then people get frustrated that they're not being heard. I did everything, but yeah, you had a business plan and your cash flow projections there, but it wasn't actually ready. So you did need to do some work to get. I think uh, Jackie's frozen, but if I could just jump in and say, um, it's a great, it's a great uh, point that she's making. And, and I do want to uh, um, commend uh, the work that's being done uh, on the West Coast to help entrepreneurs and the the BDC, we 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 they have a plethora. That, that's my, one of my favorite words. A plethora of articles and tools, <laughs> and we've taken the chance to share them on our resource page as well because entrepreneurs need to be accompanied. And I think that even Puneet will agree that that's what these resources are for. And I would echo uh, to the audience that it's important to know that. You don't have to know everything when you apply for a loan and you can get access to the best resources, best support and the best tools to help you get uh, to where you want to go. So I think that that's an, a key and important part that uh, Jackie has said and shared with us. And uh, we look forward to keeping that momentum going that your road to readiness it is lined with a lot of support. You just have to know where to access it. And there are a lot of people there to support you. Thank you. Yeah, and maybe building off of that, just because I think, you know, I, I come from more the venture investing side of things that readiness is such a big part of it, too. Right. And I think it's great that there's, you know, the 15 pitch finalists. Right. But some of them have gone through Ryerson's DMZ uh, program. Right. So they're, 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 we want to make sure that we're helping to provide those types of partnerships as well or connecting entrepreneurs to those because, it, it's it's not easy if you don't grow up in this world or have worked in this environment to know like well what is it that an investor is looking for from a pitch right and so you can watch dragon's den or shark's tank or whatnot but that doesn't really prepare you for the reality of the work right um and so at nbc similar to bdc and others it really is about partnership because we can't do it all we're not experts in everything. So working with organizations like FACE and BBC and, and others, I think are going to be really critical. Innovate BC, which is a, our a sibling organization here out in, in BC, also provides a lot of support for depending on what stage your company is at in terms of the types of wraparound services. Um, and so we're doing a project with Innovate BC, Pacifican, which is a federal agency, as well as the digital super clusters to put together a capital mapping uh, project, which will help entrepreneurs regardless of which state or sector they're in, understand, well, what are the different capital sources and um, and where can they go depending on what their needs are? So that's still in progress, though, as that comes to life, we're happy to share more about that. And then, you know, one of the other things we're really thinking thoughtfully about, too, is how do entrepreneurs even apply to to get funding from uh, from a VC, right? I think, you know, historically, it's been very opaque and network driven. So it's about introductions in order to get 
in front of a VC to start. Um, and so we're going to be launching our direct investment program in April. Uh, and one of the big things we, we spent time on was how do we make sure that this process is inclusive uh, and transparent for folks, right? And so it'll be an open application form um, for folks to submit their information. Um, but we'll, and, and we tried to make sure that the language being used also wasn't too jargony um, so that it's, it's simplified and, and easier for folks. Uh, and then providing what our criteria are so that people have an idea of, okay, do we fit the criteria? What is it that they're looking for? And how do I fill out this information, right? So that everyone has a fair shot and it's not just, well, who, who knows me already or who is two degrees away in order to be able to apply for a VC. And, and that's a big challenge, right? Often is because it is so network driven and information is so asymmetric. Um, and so stay tuned for that. If you aren't subscribed to our newsletter, do subscribe so that uh, you can get the updates as to when that process will be open. And to help support that process is our team will do monthly office hours where people can come not to pitch us, but to really, hey, hey, what does it mean when you're asking this question on the forum? So again, that we can help demystify that and, and make that process more streamlined. Because again, it's easier to go for a coffee chat with if you already know the person to be able to get that information. But how do you do that when you don't have access to those types of networks, right? And so that's really a big part for us is helping to, to make the process easier for everyone else um, who doesn't already live and breathe this world. And over time, work with our partners to help educate and provide the wraparound services so that more diverse entrepreneurs can be successful through that process. Just want to add something to uh, that what Leah said, and, and you said a word that I, I have to echo, demystify. I think that the process mm -hmm. of becoming an entrepreneur uh, and preparing documents to apply for funding, there is a lot of language and jargon that's used. Like I would much prefer to sit with Jamal or Puneet or yourself, Leah, to help me make this simple. I think, you know, in Black History Month, it, right. it's more than uh, important to give this particular quote that I held on to my whole career in working with the Black community. Malcolm X said, you know, make it plain. And I think that that's probably a big part of the work that we can do to help entrepreneurs to, to feel comfortable and confident in being able to approach this task of being able to build a business plan. And, and I think that, that that's such a critical piece that you've deposited and something that I hear often from entrepreneurs, like, I don't know what that means, but in fact, they are doing it. They just have not connected the language that sometimes can act as a barrier for them moving forward. I think Jackie's back. <laughs> <laughs> You're on autopilot, Jackie. <laughs> you left it to work. <laughs> I know. I know. It's okay. <laughs> oh, God. Thank you, guys. Yeah, technology works most of the time. This is Man, the idea. technology works most of the time. And I feel like we in the West are always forgotten because you guys in the East were just kind of going. And then Leah and Punita are good. And I'm like, why are we frozen? But thank you so much. And Leah, you actually ended up answering all the questions I was going to ask you. So I'm really glad about that. Uh, you, you talked about the direct um, investing coming up soon, I believe, and then the stages in which you're going to be uh, investing in, uh, in terms of businesses. So the one thing I was going to ask you, and we're coming up to the end, and then I'm going to wind it up with the, with the rest of the people. For us, uh, a lot of black founders, just there's usually no access into VCs. I know I have access to Tiffany and Face and Puneet and Jamal we just don't have visibility or access into fund managers and none that suddenly look like us at all. So is NBC going to be looking at ways in which you're going to help propel uh, more uh, fund managers that look like the rest of us? Because as, as Tiffany said, and that was a really important point, it's easy for Tiffany to go to you, to Jomal, to Punit. Like it's easy for me to go to Tiffany and all of that to have this conversation and say, make it easy. Most ventures that exist right now, it's not easy for me to walk through those doors and ask the same question. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, for us, when we think about our fund manager strategy, we want fund managers who are going to invest and reflect the the values mm -hmm. that we have right in terms of the impact objectives right so for example one of our first three investments was in raven indigenous capital partners the first ever indigenous led venture fund period right yeah. like how powerful is that and and their ability to help mm -hmm. support indigenous entrepreneurs and communities right yeah. um with and and what we especially liked about raven was not just who they're, they're backing, but they're really focused on what is the Indigenous impact. They're not just trying to invest in a ton of Indigenous entrepreneurs. They want to invest in solutions that are advancing yeah. 
indigenous communities and indigenous economies, right? And I think that's kind mm -hmm. of the lens we look at, you know, of how are you investing in, in in fund managers who will carry forward and invest in those diverse solutions, not just diverse mm -hmm. folks, right? Um, and, yeah. you know, it, it definitely helps having people who look like you on the other side of the table, right? But I think there is definitely multifaceted elements of how we can help to advance that um, for mm -hmm. diverse uh, communities uh, generally, right? And so we are looking at investing in uh, emerging fund managers to first time fund managers, um, especially in areas where we think there are gaps, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that's definitely one of the, the aspects we'll continue to think about and evolve. And over time, yeah. you know, we want to see, you know, what are other funding models beyond traditional debt and traditional VC that exist? Because not all right. businesses need VC. It's is a reality yeah. and that's okay right um mm -hmm. but not all of them necessarily want to go to a bank and take on a ton of debt either right and so it, i think that's part of the oh jackie changed persons um and so and so those are those are things that we're thinking about those are kind of you know, medium term things, our, our most immediate priority is really getting the direct investment program um, off the ground and running, continuing to build out more um, fund managers, uh, and then thinking about, you know, in the medium term, what are those other ideas um, that we want to bring to market, right? So I'm not sure what to do, because lost. it's a Jackie, but it's not Jackie. Jackie. Yeah. Okay. So the good news is Jackie can be used for either, but if it is, <laughs> yes. um, uh, I guess you know what We're, we are we are capable people who care about the community. So yeah. I think if I was Jackie, I would ask us final words <laughs> uh, to this piece. Jamal, you want to go first and give us your final words? Yeah. Jackie, you can just yeah. you can just we got this. <laughs> just keep going. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I feel like I feel I feel like the tech team the tech team is playing a joke on me at this rate. Huh? It's like right. I think they're probably just challenging us as panelists to see if we're paying attention to what's going on. I know, right? So, yeah. I know. You do, you do you're doing a brilliant job, but yeah, actually, thank you guys so much for just being patient, uh, for actually keeping the conversation going, and for answering really good questions. We have so much to discuss, and it was such an amazing conversation last year, and I feel like it's an amazing conversation this year. And I just appreciate you guys coming, because this is a really great way of awareness of your programs and the good work that you're already doing. Because, I mean, we come from a background of saying, Black people don't have access to funding, but it's actually changing. Tiffany is doing a great job with FACE. Jo Jamal, you and your team are doing a good job at BDC. Puneet and Leah, like there's actually... Oh, boy. Oh. Jamal, give us your <laughs> There's a lot of great words. stuff yeah. happening. It's all, all good, good. All, all good, good. <laughs> all good, all good. Okay, so, so, so final words. I, I think, I think what, I, what, I, what I would like the audience to, uh, to certainly know is that, um, particularly at BDC, um, there is a significant commitment uh, internally around supporting black entrepreneurs. Uh, and in terms of, in terms of, uh, you know, you know, how you'll see that play out, uh, you know, obviously we talked certainly about our partnerships. Uh, we are um, having some additional discussions uh, internally as far as um, uh, what we're seeing in the economy, particularly around the business transitions, where you were acutely aware of the fact that uh, that there are a number of businesses that um, that are going to be transitioned, um, that, that uh, you know, whereby entrepreneurs. I think we when, when we looked at the numbers, it was maybe about 60% of entrepreneurs are 50% um, of entrepreneurs are 60 years or older, and many of them actually eyeing a transition with many of those unable to actually transition those businesses to other members of their family. So, um, you know, if, if I were an aspiring uh, um, black entrepreneur at this point, there is obviously the opportunity of starting your own business, but there's also certainly an opportunity of, uh, you know, um, uh, acquiring or, 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 or transitioning into an already established business and making it your own. Right. Um, and again, really around the, the commitment here at BDC, I, I want to be clear that internally, um, it is it is quite significant um, internally. I know we've done quite a bit in terms of unconscious bias training to ensure that our teams are, are well equipped to actually have uh, our conversations with, with, with black entrepreneurs. Um, you know, there's uh, discussions um, around inclusive leadership, which, you know, myself as a leader, uh, as well as the other leaders here at BDC, it is mandatory for all of us. Um, we've we've made some uh, significant commitments as far as so myself and a number of other uh, leaders here at BDC. We've um, uh, been through the McKinsey Black Leadership 
Leadership Academy in an effort to support our development as well professionally. So all in all, you know, I want to be clear that, you know, certainly very committed externally, but I want to be clear that internally as well, there is that same level of, of, of commitment. We talk Yes, we do have the online portal. Yes, um, you know, um, connecting, uh, you know, with us directly. Again, I've, I've got a fairly large team and we are a national team as well. Um, uh, but also uh, our partners uh, like, like Tiffany and, and many others, the, twin, the teams of Futurepreneur, they play a significant role. And, and again, this topic of readiness, you, you really got me with this, uh, with this piece. It is, it, it is something that we're all working on as, um, uh, as to, um, to, to, to get better at. Thank you. Jamal, I'll definitely be in touch with you about that piece, for sure. Thank you so much, everyone, and thank you for being patient. And everyone who's watching, thank you for being patient with all our tech issues today. There's a storm out there, and for some reason, it's just affecting me. So I think that means I have all the good luck. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tiffany, for making this time. I, I know you know I'll be coming back to you again next year. Same for Leah and Jomal and Punit, just so we can continue to tell people what has changed, how it's getting better, and, and what else is new with any of the programs that you'll be bringing on. I think you're doing great work, and because of you guys, businesses will be able to start and scale and grow. So thank you so much for everything that you do, and thank you for being with us today. That financial roundtable was so insightful. But now we're back. I mean, I'm back with five more of our top 15 semifinalists. We're going to stay in the West. So if any of these innovative ideas are repping your hometown, let us know in the chat. As Effie mentioned earlier, we also have a poll. So if they are repping your province let us know in the poll let's kick it off with tyrone barnes of muse of people <laughs> apologies people's music therapy hello my name is tyrone barnes and i'm submitting an application today for my company people's music therapy based here in vancouver bc and i'm calling you from my home on the downtown east side People's Music Therapy aims to provide accessible music therapy services for underserved communities here in Vancouver. We also have online and telehealth options for communities that are outside of Vancouver as well. Um, I'm the only black music therapist offering music therapy services on the mainland in BC here. And I've started to develop my practice enough that I've been able to um, hire some staff so People's Music Therapy is now hiring staff and we're slowly growing. Um, one thing you notice if you spend a little, lot of time in Vancouver is that there's not much black community here. And I think if you're here for longer, you start to understand that this wasn't really an accident, that the history of Vancouver is a little bit dark in this, in this manner. Um, I actually live just steps away from a neighborhood that used to be re referred to as Hogan's Alley. And Hogan's Alley now has a viaduct going through it. Um, the city of Vancouver just built a highway through the original black community here. So what's the power of music? What am I passionate about? People, music, and therapy. Music has the ability to bring people together. Um, and one of the things that we're doing right now is we're opening up the first music therapy studio in BC, right here in the downtown east side. This is going to be a place for at-risk youth, um, adults with addiction, or children with neurocognitive or autism sort of disorders, able to come in, experience community, be a part of a studio where they can create hip hop and rock and make all sorts of, of, of beats and, and learn an instrument. And um, they can do all of this with the uh, support of a music therapist. Um, that's pretty much um, my elevator speech. Uh, thanks for listening, and I hope to hear from you soon. That was a wonderful elevator speech. <laughs> for me, music has also been very influential in my life. I'd like to know your favorite songs. Write that in the chat, too. And we're bringing it back to the East. Let's welcome Rain Park, whose brilliant idea is Secure Me. Hi, my name is Rain Park, and I am an innovator of new methods and products my ideas help to create a sense of security, safety, and a healthy peace of mind. 
Three summers ago, I was driving on a main street and saw a child about three walking on the sidewalk alone. I safely approached the child to contact the authorities when the mother ran up frantically, sharing that their son does this all the time and they were concerned for his safety. That same summer and later during that winter, I read and heard about many other incidents of our elderly community wandering away from their homes and healthcare facilities, later to be found, but some with situations ending in dire consequences. I plan on solving this issue by introducing a product that will facilitate a timely, quick thinking action that allows families, caregivers, and the healthcare community to minimize the fear and risk to health and quality of life that come with wandering when caring for impairments in our cognitive community, like Alzheimer's, autism, acquired brain injuries, and even CTEs. 13% of children will wander, 6 out of 10 people with Alzheimer's will wander, and almost 50% of children with autism will wander. I introduce to you Secure Me, an unremovable, wearable wristband or accessory worn by those with cognitive impairments. An additional accessory will be worn and carried by the family member or caregiver, alerting them to when an individual has left an area. It will indicate time of departure, distance, have a GPS locator and other features, minimizing the length of time an individual is lost and minimizing other dangers that come with wandering. I plan to bring this idea to fruition through partnerships with a research and development team and the healthcare and technology communities so that we may create a product that provides a sense of security, safety, and a healthy peace of mind. Secure Me wristbands, we will help you find the way. Shout out to Rain. I'm also in Ontario. Let's move it a bit more east and head over to Montreal, Quebec, where David Archer is from. And his brilliant idea is David Archer Therapy. Hello, everyone. My name is David Archer. I'm an anti-racist psychotherapist from Montreal, Canada. I specialize in treating PTSD, complex PTSD, and also countering the effects of anti-Black racism, systemic oppression, and eliminating the mental health consequences of racial trauma. I'm one of the only black people in the country I know who does this, so that's why I want to change that. So I wrote three books, Anti-Racist Psychotherapy, Black Meditation, and Racial Trauma Recovery, and I'm the developer of an integrative clinical framework called Rhythm and Processing. This is an approach that relies on video streaming websites, so YouTube videos of music, uh, scenes of nature, and also memory reconsolidation. So this is not no typical talk therapy. It's a different type of thing, you know? So I would need your help with the funding for this. Already I do this individually, but I'd like to receive funding so that I can reach universities, therapists in training, and also to provide workshops and presentations uh, so that I can spread the word about this. Also, I'd like to launch a pilot project in the Montreal area for a group therapy intervention based on this approach that would allow me to collect data, do research, and make this the first evidence-based approach in North America that is designed from the philosophies of anti-racist psychotherapy, that is technologically advanced, and also that is designed by black people for black people in mind. I'd like your assistance in being able to make this dream a reality. Let's just make it a bit easier for the next generation. Uh, people don't have to suffer. I'm doing this work individually, but people have to know that we can do it even more effectively if we work collectively. And also, I hope that you consider this application because we got to change the world. No one's going to do it for us. And the technology is there. It's just for us to apply it. So much respect, many blessings, and hope to hear from you. As a fellow author and entrepreneur, David, I can totally relate. Okay, but where are my fellow Ontarians at? Are you guys filling in that poll? I know it's anonymous, but I want to know. I want to know how many of you guys are repping in Ontario. We've got someone who is from Brampton. Shout out to Brampton, Makisha Banks, and her brilliant idea is Everbella. Did you know the wellness industry is at a $4.5 trillion market value? That means personal care, beauty, wellness, nutrition is at the forefront of consumer purchasing. 
Hi there, my name is Makisha Banks and I am a licensed medical esthetician, skincare specialist and educator for over 15 years. Growing up as a kid, I had asthma, eczema, environmental allergies and had so many different skin concerns and I couldn't find the solutions for my skin type as a black female in my community. That made me create the brand Everbella. We're a skincare brand that creates personalized self-care rituals for our customers that will help them treat their eczema, psoriasis, dermatitis, and more. Our variety of products include hydrating body butters, two-in-one scrubs, thick and creamy lotions, and conditioning oils. We are plant-based, free of chemicals, no animal testing, and we're sustainably sourced. That means that our brand is right in that sweet spot between wellness and beauty mixed together. As a Black female entrepreneur and a single mother, the problem that I faced was that I couldn't create this brand at that time to be more appealing to the community or more appealing to the market. We had a slow increase of customers, low engagement rate, low conversion rate, and not a captivating marketing material. The goal that I have for the company is to have a more commercial packaging, increase our brand awareness, reach new audiences, increase our customer sales, and improve our brand advocacy. And through having that new branded appeal, new packaging, and new marketing, we are able to tap into different marketing strategies, such as box subscription services, micro-influencer marketing, and TV broadcasting platforms. The stats are that 54% of people that are box subscribers bring in $18.8 .8 $18 billion in sales since 2020. Companies that use micro-influencers are seeing a 90% of ROI coming back because these micro-influencers have about 10,000 to 300,000 followers. And TV broadcasting platforms have on average 2 million viewers per week. Our plan is to utilize the $25,000 in these four components. $15,000 would go towards a rebranded packaging. $3,000 would go towards box subscriptions, uh, packaging, or supplies. $2,000 would go towards three to four uh, micro-influencers. And $2,000 would go towards traditional marketing and advertising. And the remaining $3,000 would help us for unforeseen costs and top up our marketing. Our outcome is that we will gain 50 new customers based on our 500 subscribers uh, from box subscriptions. We would have about 100 to 300 new customers based on the 10 to 300,000 micro influencers. And then we'd also tap into new markets through our TV and broadcasting. So we're hoping that you would help us reach that new scale with our business and help us on this journey. Thank you so much. Okay. Who else needs a box? I definitely need a box. I'm convinced, especially if you're a micro-influencer, go show Bella some love. Also, my apologies, bonjour to all of our uh, francophone attendees. Let's bring it back to Montreal, Quebec City, and introduce Shama Rosador of Royalty Natural. Hi, my name is Shama Rosador, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Royalty Natural proudly mother of four, I hold a bachelor's degree in human resources and a hairless specialist certificate. Oh, oh, but most of all, when snowflakes fall. I during my last pregnancy leave in 2016 when I purchased our hair salon with my sister. When I was eight years old, I experienced discrimination for my short hair and my kinky hair and about my physical appearance. I would come home and cry, cry my life. Ask God why he didn't give me long hair and easy to style hair. Then when I grow up, I understand that my difference will be my strengths. That's why I decided to create the first Canadian hair line for children with Afro hair. No more parents will have problem doing their children's hair and the children will appreciate their difference. I now develop, manufacture, and distribute my products in Quebec. The $25,000 will help me a lot. First, to develop hair care training and coaching for mother and father of our community. Second, expand our brand in new markets 
uh, within Canada in order to promote self-love, awareness, and proud of our hair. Third, invest in complementary accessories and books that be promoted in our business aimed at strengthening the confidence and proud pride of the next generation in our community and develop eco-friendly packaging that achieve our sustainable development goals. Thank you for this opportunity. Girl, yes, yes to hair products, yes. In a little bit, you all are going to head over to the live events tab. Not sure where it would be, but you're gonna click on the Black Youth Entrepreneurship Part One session. Let us tell you a little bit about how BEBC is helping the youth with our Black Youth Entrepreneurship programs. Advocacy is actually one of our most important mandates for BEBC. There's a lot of black serving organizations, but the one thing we've missed is advocating for us within policy. If you look at programs, if you go to the government, they'll say we have a lot of programs for small businesses. But most of the time when black businesses try to sign up for those programs, we don't qualify. Because the criteria that has been put together eliminates us. They don't do that knowingly. It's just we're not at the table when the criteria is being put together. And so BEBC's most important job is to, to, to be in that table. We are doing everything we can, relationships with ministers, with the federal government, with the provincial government, with the city government, to be at that table. So when, when any sort of policy is being made, any criteria is being made for programs, we want to be there so that when the criteria is out and we apply for programs, we can actually get in. So there is a lot of programs to support businesses, but we don't qualify for them most of the time. So our advocacy is to make sure, A, we are at the table, we are advocating for ourselves, or if there's anything coming in terms of funding, in terms of grants, that we can actually have access to it. And speaking to the government in terms of new programming, right? We want to make sure we are at those tables, not just asking for programming, but affecting how that programming is being done so that when it's actually launched and black businesses can go in, they can succeed in actually getting money. And so policy advocacy, program advocacy, and that's just not with the government only, it's also with the corporations. So essentially with any sort of society where you bring people together, they have a goal and the goal could be to bring the collective together in order to achieve something. For BEBC, we are advocating for you. What we are really doing here is uh, providing a platform to lift your, to, to, to allow you to leverage things. And in this case, we are providing a platform, for example, for you to be able to access uh, the, the procurement programs uh, or services for government and corporation. We're providing a platform whereby we are able to gather more black business together to create connections and synergies as a, a platform. So when we advocate for you, we really are here to support you and really provide you with um, the, the platform that you need in order to lift you. The youth are our future and we support them and encourage them to grow and develop so much. One of the most fundamental parts of that process is working with our board member, Peter Moriga. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our next guest, um, Mr. Good Vibes. Mr. Gr Good Vibes grew up in that free community his whole childhood before receiving a bursary to attend a private school downtown. He was cut from many soccer teams, bullied, and went through racism. He's no stranger to struggle and is very relatable to youth audiences. He, today, he is the CEO of Good Vibes Enterprises, a digital marketing company helping businesses reach Gen Z and millennials. Within a few years of starting his business, he has had the opportunity to work with some of the greatest brands in Canada, including Tim Hortons, Cineplex, Loblaws, Burger King, and many more. Prior to being a full-time entrepreneur, he was an NCAA Division I soccer player in the United States after receiving several full scholarships offering grade 10, uh, offered by grade 10 in high school.
All right, all right, all right. Let me just grab a quick sip. About to come with some heat. Okay, what are we talking about today? I think we're supposed to be motivational. Black History Month, got some young hustlers listening to this, I would assume. Okay, let's motivate and inspire. But not in the corny way. Like, I'm gonna tell some real life stories here that could provide some value. All right, anyways. What's up, y'all? Mr. Good Vibes here, aka Tony Downey, CEO of Jobify. So who am I? Before I get into anything, I think it's important you know who I am and why I'm worth listening to and why you might be able to relate to some things I say and get some value from it. Well, right now I'm the CEO of Jobify, as I mentioned, which is a mobile app that helps teenagers get jobs. We're operational across all of North America and we've put millions of dollars into young people's pockets uh, with, with all the states and provinces and major cities we're operating in with the users we have. And honestly, it's, we're, we're doing good work. So I have to congratulate the team and everyone involved because it's truly amazing to see young people who have a dream in mind. Let's say they want to pursue piano. They need money for piano lessons or they want to save up for university or they need some work experience to add to their resume or whatever they're trying to do in life. Usually they need money. And so we created a platform where we make that possible. No one else was doing it at scale. Indeed, Monster, LinkedIn, everyone was focused on the adults. But I think a society that's not helping the, 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 the youth, the future of our generation, that won't end well. I think we need to put more focus on the youth. So that's the first thing. That's what I'm up to right now. I'm 24. This is my main business. I obviously have a public speaking brand under Mr. Good Vibes Persona where I'll do corporate speaking, speaking to big companies like Spotify, other companies I'm connected to, Dave & Buster's, Burger King, Tim Hortons, whoever I'm working with. I'll usually come in there, do some keynote speeches on uh, technology, marketing, branding, whatever the case may be. And then I have the youth side of things where I'll speak to, to the high schools, middle schoolers, students in general, universities, and share my story, first of all, and get into whether it's entrepreneurship, career development, personal growth, there's, there's so many things I speak on nowadays that that's why I just say, I just, just the Mr. Good Vibe show. Uh, what, what are we talking about today? What are, you, what are you guys interested? I'll figure out a way to, to make my story and experience relevant to that. So I wish this could have been live. Uh, I do really wish this could have been live. However, I'm traveling to Miami in a couple of days for a speaking tour and it's going to be pretty crazy. So that's why we couldn't do this live. I am happy to answer any questions you might have at the end of this through my Instagram or LinkedIn. If you, someone wants to prop them up or put them in the chat, however you guys do this. Uh, my Instagram is Mr. Good Vibes with two eyes, and LinkedIn is Mr. Good Vibes. So you can find me there. Feel free to connect. Let's chat. But as I was saying, Jobify, public speaking. I also run a marketing agency. We are a digital marketing agency where we help small to mid-sized businesses. And we've actually dabbled with Fortune 500 companies now on their social campaigns when they're targeting a, a younger demographic, whether it's TikTok, YouTube ads. So we, a lot of different things going on. I just, I run these businesses, uh, full-time entrepreneur, and it's a lot of fun. I will say it is a lot of fun, but I didn't always start with that. Definitely not a trust fund baby was born to teenage parents, had humble beginnings, had a unibrow, big peanut head, didn't get any attention from any girl I ever liked growing up. Uh, it's tragic. But, you know, sometimes you have to flip the script. And entrepreneurship's been my vehicle. I love it. It's an amazing game. I think more people should consider it, but it's very hard. And my stories I tell you here today should inspire you and show you that someone coming from a position of you know, being bullied, picked on, cut from every soccer team he tried out for, humble beginnings, not the greatest looking. Someone coming from all of that adversity can definitely inspire you because I found a way to turn it around. My first love was soccer. I guess I should go into a little bit of storytelling here. My first love was soccer. And I ended up getting several Division One soccer scholarships to basically, if you're not familiar with sports, that's like a level before you go pro and uh, you have the possibility, high possibility of getting drafted. And I was dabbling with pro as I was playing in Uruguay with this uh, professional team out there before I accepted my scholarship. So it was, it was quite interesting. Like soccer, I had a path, but I didn't love it enough. Business was 
introduced me very early. I was 14 when I started my first business, a landscaping business. And I went on, and I went and knocked on every door in my neighborhood. And I said, hey, I'll cut your grass for 20 bucks. And I accumulated enough of those from my neighborhood to another neighborhood and so on. And where the, to the point where I had relatives working for me, teammates working for me, and I was making tens of thousands of dollars profit as a 14, 15 year old. Cause we, were, we weren't just doing like cutting grass anymore. We were doing interlocking, like a bunch of other projects involved with landscaping. So it was quite cool. And then I said, I could be good at this thing. Let me see how far I can take it. And I was always selling. I was always selling like chocolate almonds to my classmates, sports cards. I was always flipping something. And then by the time I was 17, ready to pursue my scholarships to go play in the States, I started a brand called Good Vibes, where I was basically selling t-shirts with good vibes on them. And it was a positivity movement. And that's the first time I had like a real brand. And that's where Mr. Good Vibes came from. So I was doing that, ended up going to university. Long story short, don't want to drag this story on, but dropped out of university twice, not once, twice. Both times, fully paid scholarships, room, board, uh, education, transportation, like everything was covered and I still dropped out because it was my time. I realized if I could spend these years building a business or practicing my craft, so to speak, and you know, networking and learning, I'd be really far ahead of anybody by the time they were basically where I'm at now at 24, when all my other classmates and colleagues are working jobs they don't really like, and they're looking at me, oh, damn, how did he do it? Like, I wanna be like that. I wanna do what I, want, what I want in life. And this brings me to a main point of mine. I think the reason I even started public speaking in the first place to students and inspiring them to do what they love and pursue their passions and goals and work really hard is because I look around and I see too many people settling. Everybody that you look at who's unhappy has settled in one way or another. If we look at this world, there's a bunch of unhappy people who they've settled, whether it's the car they're driving that they've settled on, uh, the, the person they're dating they've settled on, they're, they don't really want to be dating them, but they're like, I don't want to be lonely, so let me just settle. Uh, the career they have, in most cases, this is very common. They settle with the career they have. And I'm just like, why settle? We get one life. You're really going to spend this one shot at life we get, so far as we know, with this existence. Uh, I'm a man of God, by the way, but I'm speaking in this plane, this experience at life that we get. You're going to settle? Like, to me, that doesn't make any sense. So from a young age, I told myself, I refuse to live at the bottom or the middle. I'm going straight to the top. By any means necessary, I will win and entrepreneurship has been my vehicle. And because I've worked so hard, I could see the people around me who are unhappy. It's usually a result of them just giving up too early. Like this game, especially entrepreneurship, it's all about perseverance. You have to be able to take problems that come your way, solve them first of all, but don't get bogged down by the failures. But also don't get too high just because you're winning in a moment. There's a middle ground where you have to be steady, a state of Zen where it's, Okay, cool, something great happened, but you know what? I'm gonna enjoy the moment. Let me, let me just, let me not get too comfy. Or something really bad happened, you got your heart broken, or I don't know, you lost some deals. Don't worry, we could work on it. Failure isn't that crazy if it's not catastrophic. So unless you go out of business, then failure doesn't really mean anything, right? Like you could learn from certain failures, there's a cliche saying about that, but at its core, you can always bounce back, find a way to bounce back. So you got to have perseverance as an entrepreneur. And I don't know where you're at with your business journeys, but I'm assuming it's beginning phases. Perseverance. I think another thing that helped me was I was self-aware. Self-awareness is huge. When I started my speaking tours as Mr. Good Vibes, uh, I got sponsored by Dave and Busters and Burger King to do these basically these North American tours where I'd go into high schools and middle schools and sometimes universities and motivate the students. But it was only because I knew who I was. I knew my strengths. I knew I had a interesting story that I could share and I knew I was different than other speakers in a time where other speakers were going in there like, Hey kids, don't do drugs. And that was the whole basis of their whole speech. I was like, I could stand out here. I'm going to go in there playing little baby. I'm going to play some hip hop. Uh, some pop smoke, whatever's popular, right? Whatever type of songs the crowd would want to listen to. 
I'm gonna go give away some cash, some, some free Whoppers, some game cards. I'm gonna make this fun. I'm gonna be myself. And that worked really well for me. That's why I'm at where I'm at now. Even if we look at where Jobify is, I built a team around myself because I knew my core strengths. The first version of Jobify, yes, I built myself because I'm, I'm just like that. Like, I'll figure it out. I, I spent a few weeks. I learned enough about programming. I learned enough to, to get our first product up and running into market. But now I have a great team around me, right? People who specialize in technology, people who specialize with business development, people who specialize with operations. I like to be, you know, pitching, marketing. I still cover everything in the business and I'm competent as CEO, but I have a core team who helps me get more things done. So self-awareness is huge. Perseverance and belief, I would say, is mega, mega for any entrepreneur. If you don't believe in yourself, you've already lost. Like the world is already trying to tear you down. Everyone's already trying to tell you, oh, that idea sucks, or that's not possible, or that's too hard. Like everyone's just trying to bring you down to their level. So if you, if you, the one thing you can control on this planet is your mind. If you don't believe in yourself, you've already lost. That's the first thing. Like, you got to have that self-belief that you could do anything. When I walk around, I'm competent in a lot of things because I work hard to get to that point. But there's not much where I'm like, oh, I can't do that. Actually, there's nothing. Because I really believe, truly, if there's something I wanted to do, I would put the time in and get it done. That's the kind of guy I am. And that kind of confidence, I would say, only comes when you know you've put in work in your craft and your belief in your abilities outweighs the potential doubt you might have. And how do you get to that point? Putting the hours in. There's, there's no shortcut. There's no fake confidence tip I'm going to give you here. There's no hack by some guru. It's just you got to put in the hours. So if you're not good at something and you're lacking confidence, there's one solution. Put in the time. And, and this game's pretty simple if you abide by these kind of principles. There's, there's more I could obviously cover, and this is a quick 15 minute type presentation. So I wanted to go no script, just off the dome, whatever came to mind, stuff that might, that might be valuable to you on your journey. And I look forward to answering any questions you might have. I'm sure there's a lot running through your brains and there's a lot I could speak on. I haven't even got to mention everything I've been through or all the experiences I've had or the people I've met along the way yeah, there, there's a lot of ways I think I could be useful to any young person pursuing entrepreneurship and anything in life in general. Feel free to reach out. But I got to bounce. Got to go take care of a couple things. Got to go be a G and just, just win. I think that's what we like to do around here. And I think you should strive for the same. Win by any means necessary because life is very competitive. And I was about to take a sip of water, but I don't want to interrupt this train of thought. The final note is... I think winners win, losers will make excuses, whether it's because of a pandemic or the state of the economy, losers make excuses. Don't be one of those people, figure out a way to get it done and just work hard. We'll talk soon, peace. All right, y'all, let's roll. Wow, thank you, Tony. That was so truly some good vibes. Uh, now off to Jordan and uh, Wasim. Wow, 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 wow. Such great information, everybody. Um, we're going to go to another short break. But before that, we're going to do polls again with Effie. So stay tuned. Thank you so much. Everyone, please remember that the poll is open. And I want you to keep populating that with your feedback because it's truly important to us. And also remember that you will be automatically added into the prize draw. Okay, we're going to take a break and we'll see you very shortly. Welcome back, everyone. Let's see how you're doing. In the chat, let us know how you liked your session. Tell us your biggest takeaway. Okay, so it's been a powerful event so far. Um, and what I would like to do right now is just take a moment to do a quick state change, right? Um, I feel like now is a good time to stand up with me, okay? Do a little shake, get the energy out. We've all been sitting. Do a dance. Come on, Wasim, dance with me. <laughs> okay. Whew. Okay, let's bring it back in. Take a deep breath. And release. Whew. Awesome. Okay. 
So that was a lot of fun, but let's get back to the learning. Real quick social media plug. Don't forget to follow us at BEBC Society. Okay, that's super important, guys. Stay linked in with us. There's so much value there. Um, and so what we're going to do now is we're going to transition into the fireside chat with Eldon Holder. Um, he's the director at ESDC. So what you're going to need to do is you're going to actually need to go to the live event tab and you're going to have to click fireside chat. Okay. So while you're doing that, I'm going to welcome back to the stage, the CEO and co-founder of the BEBC, Jackie Cassandi. Hello, everyone. I am so excited to be talking with uh, Elton, Elton Holder today. Uh, he is amazing and does great work. And uh, he's the executive advisor, uh, UNDPAD, uh, which is the UN Decade of um, for People and Organization of African Descent at Employment and Social uh, Development Canada. I am so excited to be talking with you and having this fireside chat with you, Eldon. Hello. Jackie, good morning. Uh, a fireside chat is exactly what we need uh, in this month of uh, uh, February. So a pleasure to meet you uh, again and uh, looking forward to chatting with you. Excellent. So tell us a little bit about your department, its mandate, uh, the key services that uh, support Black Canadians. You know, any you know, goal baseline is baseline awareness. So just anything we can learn about you and your department. Yeah, it's a, probably a, a great place to start because, I, as, as you just mm -hmm. mentioned, I work for Employment and Social Development Canada. We tend to say uh, at the federal level, it's a department that sort of touches Canadians from the time a new baby comes into the world and requires a social insurance number and mm -hmm. uh, go through uh, the early childhood places of work, university work, job, hopefully yeah. uh, a job that lasts for a lifetime and mm -hmm. uh, retired and receive benefits, etc. ESDC is the department that's largely mandated to uh, support Canadians through that stage. We have four ministers, mm -hmm. so it's that big of a department uh, touching labor, Service Canada. Obviously, I talked about the social development and policy uh, as aspect and seniors is a particular area of interest. So that in a mm -hmm. nutshell uh, is ESDC uh, and, and its mandate. Oh, perfect. And, and that's important for us because your, your department's touching on labor and social development means it touches small businesses, which impacts us as BEBC and all of our members. So really lovely to be talking to you about that. And a little bit about United Nations Decade for Peoples of African Descent and your advisory work there. Well, as you know, thank you, um, the UN Decade for People of African Descent, sometimes we use the moniker of UNDPAD. Uh, yeah. The Government of Canada in 2018 adopted the decade, a few years after the after it was adopted uh, by uh, the UN body in 2015, so it's a 10-year decade. And okay. after 2018, the government uh, took uh, several actions, uh, not just in Employment and Social Development Canada (ESDC) uh, mm -hmm. to sort of uh, stimulate conversations, investment measures to better understand uh, Black communities. Uh, I would say when I'm having conversations with uh, communities and organizations in the role uh, of UNDPAD, I'm always talking about the departments who have since then uh, taken mm -hmm. sort of steps and measures to better understand Black communities as part of the UNDPAD. It's important to know that there are three pillars under the UN mm -hmm. decade for which their priorities activities. One is on recognition the other on justice. Yeah. And the third, which I think generally more applies uh, with the work and the organizations that you support at BEBC mm -hmm. is on development, employment, and those sorts of things. So what I say to organizations and entities all the time is that mm -hmm. there is, all departments are touched and implicated by the UN decade, but there's 12 that you should know and 
four in particular <laughs> when you're talking mm -hmm. about business and entrepreneurship that are quite important. So ESDC is, is obviously one of them because it's the one that, as I yes. mentioned before, a, a main key door. And I was with my deputy minister, interestingly, last night at a meeting and what he where he said, uh, and that is DM Tremblay, that there's because of the size of ESDC and the footprint across the country, there's really no wrong door. If you really want to get at understanding uh, what services are available, how you can impact those, then um, uh, CESDC is a door. But there's ICED, uh, so that's mm -hmm. a, uh, innovation yeah. and service. I think you're familiar with that. They have the Black Entrepreneurship yes. Program, et cetera, et cetera. There's the Procurement and Service uh, Canada, PSPC, that has a, a Black mm -hmm. Pilot. You may be aware of those. I tell people yes. all the time that there is a, a wage it's a department that focuses on women and, and women's needs and mm -hmm. issues. You ought to be. So there's 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 a, a few. They're all having programs. They're thinking or wanted to consult on how to better serve communities under the UND pad. Mm -hmm. But these four, yeah. if you're in the game, you must do organize yourself to really get to know not just me, but the players who do the real day-to-day -day work uh, on, yeah. on, uh, on behalf of the decade. So uh, thank you. I have to say that's why I was excited to talk to you. I think we in the Black community don't really have a great realization on the importance of ESDC, to be honest. As you said, the four components of ESDC impact the Black community 100%. And so it's so important for us in the Black community to understand what these four levers are, uh, to get engaged uh, in those so that we can get all the programs moving, and also just to learn for ourselves in terms of advocating for ourselves. And what we need is like this massive department has four things that impact our entire lives, but really, really impact us as entrepreneurs, no matter how it will look like. So thank you so much for sharing that and educating uh, our viewers uh, on that. So given that we're one week away, what are the initiatives that your department has launched in support of UNDPAD? Well, I think depending on who you're talking to, they would say it's a lot. And when I'm out talking to communities, they say it's a lot, but not enough. So uh, this is the dynamic of uh, what makes this work uh, exciting. And uh, uh, the people who work with you in co-creation and co-partnership are excited about that. Mm -hmm. Particularly when in uh, ESDC, I would say that we launched a, a something called the Supporting Black Community Initiatives. And this mm -hmm. is uh, so that is set a structure within ESDC that helps to work with community organizations to build their capacity to deliver mm -hmm. on their mission, whatever that mission is. Obviously, the, the right. priorities uh, starts off around social policy and vulnerable populations, because mm -hmm. oftentimes those are the ones that sort of fall behind black, white, uh, youth, women, it, it doesn't matter. But in this particular case, uh, on, as part mm -hmm. of the UN decade, we've created a supporting Black Canadian community initiative to look at policies, programs through what we would call a Black-centric lens. And so yes. uh, that's something that folks should be uh, aware of. That program mm -hmm. we have uh, invested, I would say, over the since the start of the decade, over one hundred million dollars mm -hmm. to to, to uh, yeah. black community organizations to build their capacity yeah. and infrastructure. Um, mm -hmm. Another initiative is we just was probably in the news the black led and. Endowment fund. Yeah, uh, yes. That's something that's yes, within definitely. ESDC that the minister and government uh, was very proud to announce uh, to help mm -hmm. build uh, uh, capacity in the charitable s sector. Uh, mm -hmm. On a little more legislation, we have just uh, uh, we are in the process of completing an Employment Equity Act review. In fact, prior to me taking on this, coming back to this role, I actually was the lead uh, executive on the review of the Employment Equity Act review, uh, an, an act that's been in place since 1986 that covered four designated groups that was in mm -hmm. uh, in need for a review uh, because that, the, that that is for not just government employees, that's for all employees covered oh. under the federal jurisdiction who must, uh, uh, employers must better respond uh, appropriately in mm -hmm. the area of workplace, uh, recruitment, uh, training, uh, 
promotions, et cetera, et cetera. Those four groups are indigenous populations, women, persons with disabilities, and this catch-all category we call visible minorities. So we heard right. from lots and lots of uh, communities, experts, academics on what the new act uh, should uh, should look like given a, a changing mm-hmm. in modern Canada. And so uh, yeah. these are things that are within ESDC. Uh, and that last, I would say we have also within ESDC have a social procurement uh, kind of strategy that focuses targets on, uh, on Black uh, uh, businesses with impact. So we're very, very mm-hmm. proud of, of uh, those initiatives over the last year. Uh, of course, hearing stakeholder feedback is always the need that, that drives uh, uh, government policy. We take credit mm-hmm. as departments, but largely these things are, uh, are being driven by uh, stakeholders' interest and uh, mobilization mm-hmm. uh, and so on. So. That's amazing. And so as talking about um, applying a black lens and and you guys getting a lot of feedback and, and the new programs that have been launched, it's really good to hear. But I think what I'm hearing as well is the feedback came out of mobilization. And are you able to talk to us and other black serving organizations and just the community about the importance of a sustained mobilization and what that looks like? Because you in the government needs to hear from us, but we need to actually be able to express ourselves, allow our data to be taken so we can have the numbers and then come and present this to the government uh, and advocate for ourselves. So if you were to give us advice on the importance of mobilization, what would that be? (laughs) It's interesting. Um, I kind of say this all the time. I think um, as communities, we know right, mm-hmm. that uh, if you want to go fast, you go alone, you know that. But if you want to go further and sustain that staff, uh, it's an old kind of African proverb, I'm chopping up badly here. Uh, you go together, right? You want to mm-hmm. get further. And so that mobilization is a critical element in a country is, that's coast to coast to coast like Canada, Mm -hmm. where we're scattered uh, from rural to mid cities, to emerging cities, to big, large cities like Toronto and Montreal. And so that mobilization at the federal level is absolutely critical. One other important Mm -hmm. thing to probably uh, know is, I mean, when I think of of black uh, communities, probably like all communities, but because we're talking particularly about this, you're bundled. So you may bundle Mm -hmm. meaning that you're not on one thing. You know, yeah. um, you may be a, a business, you may have strong business interests, looking to start businesses, want to where, find out where supports are. Uh, mm-hmm. But we're also probably taking care of a retired parent or uncle or aunt, struggling with youth, volunteering in some of these organizations that, you know, mm-hmm. apply for funding. It, I, I just think in my own situation, I have an aunt uh, uh, celebrated her 87th birthday that's living alone in, um, in the Bronx, New York. And all through the pandemic, we have not had a chance to kind of, she's sort of been able to move along. And and so she would come up or we'd go visit. But because for two years plus, you know, we've just been Mm -hmm. FaceTiming and whatever. But that's a kind of a, despite what I'm doing on Saturday here, talking about work with you, about work and the the summit. uh, Yeah. Our lives are bundled with other things. And so when mobilizations are critical, so even mm-hmm. if you're talking business, mm-hmm. you have to be interested in the broader uh, priorities, yes. concerns, anxiousness of communities. Yesterday, the, mm-hmm. the government announced the Black Justice Strategy. Right? Right. That's, that's huge in the pillar. Communities need to, and it's part of our tradition, anyways it's just sort of making mm-hmm. that point that mobilization uh, uh the power of one is is good to start things but to sustain yeah. and build momentum our strong interest and abilities in mobilization right agreed 
Uh, and that honestly is what we're trying to do to get into stronger mobilization and advocacy as one. And I think from your perspective, um, I, I want to say, and maybe this is as a question, you've, have you seen in ESDC a sustained mobilization in other equity groups, serving groups, you know, like indigenous groups, women groups, and others seeking employment and all, all things like that. And change has happened when they did that as one block. And I feel like for the black community, we're just getting around to starting to do sustained mobilization as one group. We've had mobilization for small groups on small things, but as one large group, I don't think that we've achieved that just yet. Would you share a little bit of your thoughts on what you've seen other groups do in terms of mobilization that has worked? Hmm. Yes, I'm happy, happy to. I, I think um, before working in government, uh, you know, I work inside private sector, nonprofit sector. I, uh, before I came into yeah. gov again, uh, I was the vice president for the national organization known as the YMCA, YWC here in the National Capital Region of Ottawa. Yeah. And uh, community engagement, at that time we were talking about communities in needs, not necessarily uh, mm -hmm. black Canadians mm -hmm. and so on. And so what that has shown me and of course, I was a leader in that organization. Uh, the importance of uh, learning from others. And so, uh, on the indigenous, for example, very, very uh, happy in terms of what the mobilization, the coordination, the sustained engagement has led around their UN decade mm -hmm. for the rights of indigenous persons, right? If right. you if you think about uh, the struggle, the historical struggle of indigenous, just as one community, but similar on the uh, uh, persons with disabilities, for example, we now have an Accessible right. Canada Act that's also out mm -hmm. in ESDC. We have an indigenous yes. office. We have a department on indigenous issues. We have the same thing on women, we have a wage uh, department for women. Mm -hmm. So all of those things come out of sustained engagement. Um, and mm -hmm. so those are some examples that has been through time. And so communities that are new and emerging uh, have to accelerate that kind of learning about the, the right. we know it's not, a, we know, and what we've heard and through studies and Stats Canada, recent census data and all of the kind of educational pieces that there's, it's not a mm -hmm. question of talent right it's not a question of resilience it's not a question of perseverance right mm -hmm. uh usain bolt won the 100 meters because there's no one stopping him there's no one pulling him back from running <laughs> okay mm -hmm. and so what we have to do is to leverage that mobilization that know-how um and the kind of persistence that often re that some of these other uh groups have done and continue mm -hmm. to do and and it's 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 a democratic country that we're in and yes. um uh, our work starts when communities tell us mm -hmm. uh, uh what their priorities concerns and needs are and so this decade Fantastic. is just a place to amplify a bit of mm -hmm. those needs at the summit this year one of our workshops is just specifically black serving organizations. We basically reached out to all black serving organizations and said, we're having a summit, come and join us. And then let's just talk about what services other black serving organizations have so that we can start to get together hopefully and, uh, and start to advocate for ourselves as one big group. So this is just kind of a starting, but I'm hoping we can have one that is fully national in terms of doing that work. Do you have any advice for us in terms of understanding the system so that we can actually navigate them effectively to advocate for ourselves as uh, black entrepreneurs and businesses? Well, the, the advice generally for me when I'm talking about this is framed around um, uh, you have, you're doing the work, like right? you're doing the work. You are uh, making a difference in the communities where your lives are centered, mostly. Uh, the, there's three levels of government and there's only so much time because of what I said mm -hmm. about the bundled responsibilities that uh, individuals have and communities have. Mm -hmm. And so 
we have to kind of scale our approach as opposed to um, wanting to do everything. And uh, communication is a critical piece. So it's the idea of what is the starting points around the needs of communities. So we've talked about the UN decade pillars, but they're sub pillars. Mm -hmm. And when we're out engaging mm -hmm. with communities, as I said last night, I was fortunate to be out with uh, a few deputy ministers um, and then with communities uh, mm -hmm. talking about, uh, in that particular case is one of the, on the, uh, the UN permanent forum discussions that took place mm -hmm. in Geneva in December. So where there was a debrief with about uh, uh, 20 individuals, organizations, we call them civil service organizations. So these conversations mm -hmm. come up of how to continue to do that, to have access. And for us from the government yes. side, the bureaucratic side to to build infrastructure that makes that a bit easier. There's an education mm -hmm. piece around navigating government, right? Yes. There is a navigation. Yeah. And so I say to folks within ESDC, but as I said, other departments, um, I would use that as your starting door to understanding mm -hmm. uh, what services exist, uh, yeah. how it's uh, uh, being applied, et cetera, et cetera. It's sort of a mm -hmm. good place to start under the Supporting Black Canadian Community Initiative. I am amazing, Eldon. I cannot tell you what, what a joy it is just to talk with you. I could talk with you for hours. Just you have so much <laughs> knowledge and so much education for us. I love it so much. And now, as per your request, you're going to turn the lens back to me and ask a few questions about BEVC. And I love that so much. Thank you. So I'm going to pass the mic over to you and I'm going to be your recipient to the questions. Well, that's a dangerous thing to give a black guy, uh, you know, a microphone. <laughs> you haven't been to too many uh, black people's weddings. You do not give the microphone, but uh, I, I will try to kind of manage that <laughs> for you. No, I Thank think uh, uh, the work of organizations like yours are very, very important to building up the backbone, right? We know that in Canada, mm -hmm. any data, I guess, uh, yeah. not just Canada, but uh, certainly in the U.S., uh, uh, small businesses and entrepreneurship are kind of the, mm -hmm. the key source uh, of uh, our economy. And so when mm -hmm. I was thinking about uh, your organization, the Black Entrepreneur and, and the Summit, I wanted to kind of get a better sense of what do you need to create a kind of, um, I don't want to say even playing field because it's, it's, that can be argumentative. But generally, mm -hmm. you know, um, what do you what do you need from governments? What do you need from your institutions as a first start, uh, based mm -hmm. on what you're hearing from your members? Uh, that's a really good question. Thank, thank you so much. So. Uh, as, as any organization, I'll say, uh, of course, what we need is, is funding to help us do the work we're doing, right? Uh, a lot of our work is done by volunteers. It would be great to have, to have some funding to progress the, the initiatives that we have. But more than that, I think what we need more of is proper data. You work, you, you are from the government background and from the corporate background. What I've realized is there's very little good data about black entrepreneurship and black, the black community. We have some now. After COVID, I believe that many black organizations have gone out there. I mean, Beck exists now and we are starting to collect data. But it would be nice to actually have a holistic collective data about us that we can use to advocate because if i'm coming to you in the government and i'm saying there's me there's here is something about black businesses the first thing you want to know is do you have the data to support that and i think from the background of black of black entrepreneurs and just the black community we're always you know suspicious of government what are you going to do with my data like you know what are, what is going to go there so we are not very open in terms of sharing our data but if you look at uh, communities um you know our brothers and sisters from the indigenous community from the asian community from indo canadian community they share so much data there's so much data that exists about them so that when they advocate to the government 
there's no question that the numbers actually support. And so then it leads, even for the women's groups, that's why there's a department for indigenous, there's a department for women groups. There's actually data to support that. Uh, we know that there's, I don't know, 1.5 million Canadians, black Canadians, but do we actually have segmentable data in that? I know we did the recent um, uh, data that came out of StatsCan. I would love for black organizations to actually access the underlying data that they collected. We haven't even been able to get that. So we can start to advocate for ourselves. So I'd say two things. One is uh, funding so that we can continue to support the programs. And two is data. And that is me speaking to the government, but also me speaking to us as the, as, as the black Canadians. We need to start being open about our data. Like you don't have to give, you know, personalized data about you, but data about your business, your category, your, all of that, because it actually helps for us to go and say to the government, there's, there's 300 plumbers in, in, black plumbers in Canada, and they need this kind of thing. And we can actually support that rather than just going, uh, blindly with generic numbers. So it, it behooves us to share and it behooves the government to share back. Absolutely, absolutely. No, thank you for that. I'll just maybe just say again on uh, on that, Stats Canada, right? And that's the first thing is awareness. Stats Canada have a, mm -hmm. a group that's fairly recent, recent mm -hmm. meaning under the UN decade uh, umbrella. Oh, right. Uh, that uh, uh, folks could reach out to, to talk about exactly what you've said there about mm -hmm. the need to look at data at the disaggregated level. Uh, mm -hmm. um, I said, right, the department that I know uh, focus on kind of business, the Black Entrepreneurship mm -hmm. Program, the Black the Pilot Program, PSBC. So it's that, and you can, since I, since I sort of put out there that ESDCs, uh, is the minister, the deputy has said, there's no wrong door. If none of this, if you don't mm -hmm. remember anything, reach out to them to kind of talk about yeah. that idea around data. I think there's also another thing from what you're saying, Jackie, that is important for mm -hmm. your audience to understand. There's, there's a cultural component around privacy and sharing and yeah. that kind of thing. And part of what governments can benefit from is you helping us and the communities to understand the safety, security, the uh, yes. measures that we take in managing mm -hmm. uh, personal information of Canadians. We have a privacy commissioner uh, that yeah. uh, is there to help Canadians feel secure about that data. So mm -hmm. I would just say sometimes there's coming to with the request, but there's also ways mm -hmm. that you can help communities understand yes. and appreciate the measures that we are we take as a as a, as a government as a federal, as a federal government mm -hmm. as departments yeah. to uh to re, uh, maintain the confidence of someone absolutely um, and that's so true because a part of the rule is we can't even uh, we can't store any data on servers that are not canadian like that's illegal like there's so many ways we can actually protect data i think the education piece is going to be important and we are doing our work even just having this conversation and it's to go uh, our audience uh, listening in share more about that and it's kind of secure we have ways of keeping it secure all right on, on to the next one sorry uh, <laughs> we're going to need all day just like you said at the beginning but uh just in what your answers were and you had mentioned wage earlier we were talking about the the department for women and uh, mm -hmm. certainly some of the conversations we hear about need uh, 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 I recently heard that uh, uh, black women are the most educated in, in terms of Canada. That's the Stats Canada 2021 census mm -hmm. data I was, was privy to hear in one of the other conversations. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about uh, women and forming businesses, right? We know in the U.S. that uh, women are forming the most businesses. Is that the yes. case here? Are you seeing that on the ground? Can you talk a little bit about that and how maybe uh, uh, departments can understand and support that? Absolutely. We have a, a mail list or a touch point with about 2,000 uh, Black businesses in Canada. 58 to 60 percent of those are women like that number is completely unquestionable most black women will have regular corporate jobs whatever jobs they're doing and they will have a side gig that is a business 
and then as the business grows then pull out and go into managing their business so it's completely true uh, that fact that more women are more black women specifically uh, getting into business and the one thing I, I always want to tell our community is the description of business actually I, I have a retail store, so that's very easy for someone to say she's a business owner. You can be a consultant and that's a business, right? There's actually a higher level of you to get called. At this. There's a broad level for people to, to see themselves as businesses. You can be an, uh, uh, a movie person and, and that's a business. You can be a sports person and that's a business. So there's, there's, there's a lot of us who are in business that don't even see ourselves as, as, as businesses. But from the data that we have, from the numbers that we have, 58 to 60% of the women uh, of the business owners are women. And that's just climbing. And it changed a lot during COVID as well. I think the numbers increased a great deal uh, during COVID. And we're, we're going to be doing more research to confirm this. But um, a lot of black women are just getting out of the work, work world and getting into the ownership of business, which is great. And is that, uh, yeah, that's absolutely wonderful. Uh, we know the role yeah. that. Um... Uh, mothers and aunties and sisters play in just the home and the home economy mm -hmm. uh, 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 in, in our communities. From that point of view, uh, maybe another question, those small businesses that you're describing, now in this case, beyond just women, right? Yeah. How, how are they, uh, how would you describe the role they're playing in reviving uh, uh, our economy? You mentioned COVID, uh, where uh, in black communities, it's certainly in big cities like Toronto, 83% mm -hmm. of uh, uh, the folks in those early days impacted by COVID, I mean, catching COVID, were frontline yeah. workers who were largely uh, black and racialized uh, mm -hmm. uh, individuals. So how... Uh, yeah. How is that role in reviving the economy for small, small businesses play? Actually, a great deal. We know that in Canada, small businesses are the largest employer, right? Um, and so most small, most small black businesses will end up having at least one employee or maybe one or three part-time people. And that is a direct contribution into the labor market. You could have a salon and you're, you're doing braids and you have one or two or three other people helping you and that and that's employment uh, directly. Uh, a lot of black women uh, have daycare businesses, for example, and daycare businesses means it's you and one or two or three other people that you've employed that are helping you with this daycare business. Uh, I would say we probably play a larger role in reviving the economy, but I'm, I've never really been recognized as such. My own business, I have nine employees. It's a small business. I have nine employees. So I'm contributing directly by paying the taxes into um, our province and our federal government, but also employing nine people. That, that makes a difference, especially when it's been so difficult. Um, after COVID when people lost their jobs and coming back into it right now, getting the right people and also hiring people at the right amounts. So we are playing a direct role into the economy, but we are not celebrated as such just yet. We exist on the outside of the ecosystem. And so the work BBC is doing is to try to come uh, and bring that realization going. If these 2000 black businesses and let's say 60 or 70 percent of those have employed people that's a great impact to the economy both uh, for labor and and for the taxes and just for providing the products that that people need um and and, and helping grow in in some ways and most uh black businesses have businesses that are, that includes social care and and health care and we know we are part of the backbone of doing that work. And so my my hope would be most of those black women open their own their own businesses. So you're a nurse, bring a few nurses together, open a care or some sort of facility and grow from there as an entrepreneur. So we have a lot of impact. I don't believe that that impact is seen or celebrated just yet. Well, let me be the one to say congratulations to you yourself. Nine employees, uh, uh, small business, uh, that's crossing the line from small. <laughs> once, once you're kind of talking about that, uh, 
congratulations to you and the 2,000 or so that uh, that are members uh, of your organization, the, the EBC. Access to capital, though, it, mm -hmm. it, it, we, we hear is a major issue to starting and to scaling, you know, a, a, a business, right, uh, who mostly have to start from their bootstraps and all of that stuff. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about what BEBC is doing to access for startups uh, for those folks who want to scale, expand, or even buy a business. And I'm taking notes because yes. I, I, I may be one of those uh, individuals uh, <laughs> soon. You're, you're, you're motivating me. Oh, that's amazing. You're very kind for your kind words. Thank you so much. Uh, access to capital has been, is, and will continue to be an issue for Black entrepreneurs in Canada actually for a while. And it's better to acknowledge that than not. And the, the main reason for this is because of lack of generational wealth. And we know all of us that this is true. Uh, some of, especially when, an immig when you're an immigrant, it's difficult for your parents to get here, try to give you a life and buy a house at the same time. And we know that this is a debt uh, society and you need to have debt to get more debt. You need to have a mortgage to get bigger funding and a large percentage of black Canadians that's just not true. And so if you're coming from a background where you, you don't have collateral to borrow from, you're going to bootstrap. So a lot of people have their jobs and then their jobs help support their businesses and hopefully their businesses take on and take over, then they can migrate. So which means the growth for us generally is much slower. If you look at uh, our Chinese, uh, our Asian brothers and sisters or Indo-Canadian brothers and sisters, they come from the background of insisting on home ownership first. So you'll find several families live together they all own the house and then they buy other houses, but that allows them to borrow and start their businesses. But we don't come from that culture. Our culture hasn't always been, first, first thing, try, try and get together community-wise, buy a property and then use our property to launch yourselves out and use our property to then get funding. And so we're always running into problems in terms of borrowing. Your credit score might be good, but you won't get a large amount of money because you don't have collateral. You might get 30K maybe because you own a car. But other than that, it doesn't, it doesn't actually help. So it's very, very important for us to talk about how to work through generational wealth to be able to borrow, to be able to be entrepreneurs. Uh, the other part of that is start to, starting to change the system on the on the ground. So BEBC has a pitch contest and we are hoping to actually enlarge that so that we have multiple winners a year and we can start to jumpstart these businesses or help them scale, at least for now, as we work with the banks and financial institutions and everywhere to try and change uh, the, to try and change how the system works right now. I was having a conversation with someone recently, I think it might have been Michelle Jean, and I was giving an example and saying, we black people are renters and we rent really well. If I've rented for 20 years, why doesn't that history count in my credit score? Only when I have a mortgage does it count, but I've been renting pretty well without fail. It would be nice if that counted and then that helps with the numbers and then we can actually borrow uh, because we've shown that we've been able to pay our rent for, for a while. And so what's the conversations with um, Equifax and the financial institutions going, are there other levers in which we can do this? You and I both know that will take decades before they could ever agree to change the systems. But right now, the, uh, the good thing is a lot of the banks have actually instituted programs that are supporting black businesses now. We know the government did with FACE and FACE is doing its thing uh, and we are working with banks like TD and Van City and RBC is coming along and they are all putting in programs and, and when I meet with them and we talk about the programs I'm always saying don't show me the same program you had before only right now it's a black director and a black manager. If it's the same programs, we're going to still have the same issues when we come to ask for the loan. It needs to be an actual true program that has looked as black, at black Canadians differently to be able to lend. And I have to say Van City is doing that and they're doing a good job with that. TD just announced a program that uh, we knew was coming and that's doing pretty well. RBC has a program that we are working through the kinks to see how it actually works and we're going to do test cases there. So the financial institutions are open. 
um, to working with us uh, and changing the, the, the processes right now to allow more access to funding for us. And what we do, the black businesses, and I have these conversations every day, I always tell people, book a meeting, meet, you, meet with us. We will do everything we can to get you the funding you need. And I get so many questions about grants and I'm always laughing and I'm like, we are black people. There's no grants for us. There's no one's going to give you a grant to start a business, really. There's usually very few grants that exist and you're competing highly to get them. It's better to prepare yourself to see if you can go and uh, you can save up or go and get access to funding at the banks. But how do you actually go around getting that? How do you work with BDC to get it? How do you work with, how, how, how are we doing with our financial literacy to prepare ourselves to be able to actually borrow so we can support our businesses? So this is going to continue to be a major, major issue for us, I think. We will change this because as, as I'm talking with you now and, and as, as we're talking with banks, we're trying to be at those tables when those decisions are being made so we can say, ah, this is how this impacts us as a black community. So if you put this rule here, this is how it's going to play out for us. So that they actually, so the people who are coming up with the rules or the criteria have more in mind about how it's going to impact our community. So the criteria allows us access into it because there's actually a lot of programs that exist for small businesses and, uh, and for small business owners. But most of the time, we in the black community don't can't qualify. If you if you're asking for a big insurance, we might not be able to qualify to get in. But if we were at those tables as those criteria are coming uh, are being made, then we can actually put forward uh, how it's going to play out in our, in, our, in our community and hopefully then the criteria changes. And that's what the work we're doing with the, with the banks to say, how is it working? And I was very pleased with the government being open to setting up something with FACE so that we can access loans. And I know that that, that is still being uh, worked through, but the banks have definitely come through uh, to start to work with us. It's going to be a slow process, a long process, but we are, we are working with people, getting them ready, and then getting them introduced to the actual decision makers, as opposed to if you go to a bank uh, on their website and you apply on their, web, their website, you're more likely to get a no. But if you come through BEBC and we help prepare you before you go there, and then we introduce you to the actual decision makers, you're more likely to get the loan. Uh, because the, the, the bank systems, they're all algorithm in there. So, you know, you put all the information in there, the algorithm already spits out yes or no, and then suddenly you just got to know and no one gave you an, an explanation of why. But if we prepare before we go there with the right things that they need, you're more likely to get access to funding. So we're working really, really hard on that. And as the government puts more programs in, we're going to be trying to be right in there to say, OK, how does the criteria actually work out so that more, many of us can start to qualify and get access to funding? And also beyond that is just the black community talking about generational wealth and what does the collateral game actually look like? How can we start to get in those maybe as a group as opposed to individuals so we can start to build each other up into better capital mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so uh there's a need for bebc <laughs> uh, uh certainly uh, as you're talking jackie I, I i i always had this challenge in elementary school of you know uh keeping my head and not going into different things as you were describing there because as i'm imagining all the new entrepreneurs that are that are going to be coming up if you do what you're doing and continue mm -hmm. to do what you're doing and so i had this question it may be a little bit off because i am I'm, I'm thinking of bebc and the educational role that you play in helping mm -hmm. folks understand the difference between a grant mm -hmm. and a loan right etc yeah. the level of effort that's involved a long time ago mm -hmm. you know I, I i had the opportunity to uh uh, listen to a, a well-known uh, pathologist who was interested in climbing Mount, Mount Everest, uh, Beck Weathers. This is a, a short aside and um, navigating and working through government. Uh, I've, I've used this before, are almost mm -hmm. like trying to climb Mount Everest. Uh, the, uh, this was a tragic 
incident in terms of Dr. Uh, uh, Beckweather's climb to Mount Everest. It's well documented. Mm -hmm. uh, he died twice, according to his story on Mount Everest. Obviously, he did wow. not, but uh, just the tragedy of Mount Everest. But the whole point mm -hmm. of navigating government and where organizations like yours, working with entrepreneurs, uh, come in handy, in my view, is on mm -hmm. the preparation it takes right the follow-up you don't roll out of bed and say mm -hmm. i'm going to be the best this that's yeah. a great goal but the steps to navigating successfully is mm -hmm. uh so this is just what came to mind as you were describing the role there with be BC, working with emerging and communities, we know the entrepreneurial spirit is there. And so yes. uh, as more and more people move into the entrepreneurial roles, um, mm -hmm. that could sometimes leave a gap in the workforce that uh, can sometimes uh, impact safety, security, dignity of work. Do you have any thoughts on, on that? Well, that's, that's an interesting thought um, and a really actually good question. If more people are becoming entrepreneurs, what does that look for the workforce? I would, I would reframe the thought of the workforce because let's say uh, we have a group of nurses that end up forming their own practice. They can be hired by the hospitals as a practice as contractors, as consultants to come in, so that we are empowering them to own their own businesses and their time. But that doesn't mean they can't still support the workforce, right? So if you work in IT and, and you form your own corporation and bring other people in, or let's say you're a CPA accountant, you work for Deloitte, uh, but you want to come out and support the black community and, and be dedicated to doing work for the black community and form a consultancy. It doesn't mean Deloitte can't hire you anymore as a consultant. You can still do the work. Um, uh, like, let's say, I'm going to use my example, but this is not what I'm doing. Uh, I'm a marketer by experience, by, I'm a, an ad advertiser by experience. If I had bandwidth, I could be hired back as a consultant. I could do the work. I could do projects. I could do programs, right? So I mean, um, we're working to empower the black community to take back ownership of their own time and to determine their own wages. That doesn't mean they can't support the workforce anymore. We can actually work it out so that now we are more consultants with our own businesses earning more money rather than being in the workforce and being stuck in the system and the process of what the workforce because we know many of us my experience as in the corporate world and i worked in in in, in very large organizations i was always sometimes the only black person or maybe one or four or five or six and our experiences in the workforce and and especially that was especially true here in in western canada where there isn't that many of us in ontario uh, was a bit different um, but our experience there usually you know when we, 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 we could switch sometimes when you're at work and if you come out and you become a consultant and you get hired back in as a consultant then you have more control of your work of, of, of your rules uh, and and of of your output as well as the money that you actually get back without having to deal with the drama in the corporate workforce so I think uh, I, I will say, yes, there's an impact uh, and a gap in the workforce, but I would want to reframe that for the people who do the hiring and say that same person can actually come back as a consultant with better working experience and be hired to still do the work that they were doing and bring along a group now with having been empowered to do to do more for this for themselves. And I just think of that only dialing back to generational wealth. If we become entrepreneurs and we become successful, if we become consultants and we become successful, we are more likely to be able to get to the place of home ownership better and quicker uh, than if we get stuck sometimes in, in the different jobs that we do. Mm, but I have totally, to totally. preface that and say, it depends on the level that you are and the job that you're doing. It will not always be true for everyone. 
That almost sounds like uh, the last question I was going to ask ask you as someone who's been in it for a while, both as an entrepreneur, a successful business, but also uh, as someone uh, key and critical in the the BEBC. Is there, I mean, I get asked this all the time, so I, I, I consider yeah. it fair to ask you, <laughs> like what advice, what piece of advice would you give to black business or IPOC entrepreneurs that are in the market right now? Folks are always looking for nuggets when they have the conversations like this. And so uh, mm -hmm. I'm wondering whether from your own personal experience or as yeah. one that you've picked up in the organization to be EBC, a piece of ad good advice. I know it's all going to be great. but <laughs> You're so kind, Eldon. Thank you. Um, that, well, that's that. I mean, um, I, I come from a background of always saying that I'm learning. So me sitting there saying, I have a piece of advice. I'm like, what? I'm, I'm learning too. Like, I don't know that I have any sage advice as it were. But if I was to use my experience, I'd say the biggest thing, it might sound, it might sound like what everyone says, but the biggest thing is not giving up. We might come from a background of trauma, a background of struggle, a background of poverty, a background of great wealth, whatever the background is. The entrepreneurship game is not the easiest one, especially at the beginning. It's so easy to start something and it's going and you're just like, it doesn't seem to be moving. It doesn't seem to be getting where I want it to get. And so it can feel, you can feel dejected, you can feel rejected, you can feel like you made the wrong decision, but don't give up. And the second most important piece of advice is find other like-minded people. Find organizations in your community like BEBC or BEBC. Find like-minded community because you will find like-minded people and then you'll start to encourage each other. The more you see someone else doing what you want to do, it might, it might be a completely different business. But seeing someone else who looks like you doing something gives you more encouragement to do. And, and the last piece of that is for the rest of us who are, few, are a few years ahead is to look back down and share everything we've learned. Because my belief is I've been in business for eight years now and I was in the corporate world for 15 years. I want everyone who comes behind me to skip the amount of years I skipped to get to where I am right now. If I can share the knowledge that I gained along the way do this, consider this instead of that, instead of letting people make the same mistakes we made or this have the same struggles we had to get here. So if it took seven, eight, six years uh, for my business to become successful, I would really like it to be only two to three years for the people coming behind me. So it doesn't take as long to get to where I got. So if I can share nuggets of what I have learned and collect nuggets from other people other black entrepreneurs and say, this is what we've learned. This is how we navigated getting to where we are. Maybe black futurepreneurs will have quicker success. They won't have to be in their late 30s, late 40s, late 60s uh, seeing success. It would be great if they can start to see the success in their early 20s. You know, it would be nice to have successful business people that are in their early 20s so they can build generational wealth earlier so that their kids coming alongside after them have success and more comfort earlier than the rest of us did. So it it goes it goes on not giving up, finding a community of like-minded people who look like you that are doing the same thing, like looking for organizations like BEBC, and there's so many black serving organizations. So whichever it is in your community, and then for the rest of us actually sharing back the knowledge that we've had as opposed to working individually and in silos, like share, I come from an African background. So as you said before, community is so important. It, it's a requirement that if I have knowledge that I share it. And so if we start doing that in the black community and we share the knowledge we have without holding back, then we'll bring everyone and the whole community up together. <laughs> Inspired, uh, inspired. Uh, I certainly um, appreciate the idea of never giving up. And because, as I was saying, the thoughts that come to my mind when I'm listening to you and the idea of, of black resilience. And uh, mm -hmm. sometimes there's no choice uh, to, to give up. And I'm thinking of people yeah. like Muhammad Ali. Uh, I'm thinking of Harriet Tubman. I'm thinking of the 
uh, a tank man in Tiananmen Square in 1980 <laughs> something uh, that yeah. stood up against the the, the tanks uh, I mentioned before back weathers uh, um, and so for me uh, now you mentioned Africa so Nelson and uh, Winnie Mandela yeah. uh, mm -hmm. so the the character of never giving up perseverance persistence is this kind of ingrained in in change and in progress and so uh, mm -hmm. uh you're inspiring me in terms of the advice your the little nugget of advice that you've shared so uh thank you so much so it's been such a joy talking with you uh eldon and and having such a great conversation i think my last question for you is you're doing great work within government. Your existence in government helps support organizations like me support uh, black businesses. And so this is our tiny part uh, we are playing. So I imagine that there would be other people who want to come up in government to be able to, you know, help with the um, UND part and all the other things that the government is doing to help move the black community along. What advice would you have for a black person who is looking to get into government, who's looking to have an impact in government, who's looking to navigate within government uh, to do similar work to what we're doing in terms of helping black Canadians? Yeah, very, uh, thank you. And I would say uh, from the government point of view, Recruiting talent is something that is foremost in front of uh, all departments, I would say, especially in this uh, in these times. And so mm -hmm. uh, talent and education is not uh, the question. Uh, mm -hmm. There is the public process, obviously, uh, to uh, uh, job.gc.ca, uh, where all of our, mm -hmm. our postings are. But what I, when I talk to people about the idea of government is that in particular kind of uh, communities who are not often in the policy making, I'm not talking at the uh, administrative levels, but in the design of policy right. review of programs, etc. Mm -hmm. More than ever, uh, that lens that I mentioned before, that black centric lens embedded, not as part of the decade per se, but just as mm -hmm. regular core business yes. helps us to deliver better for Canadians. So if there's a motivation mm -hmm. of delivering for Canadians, we're black Canadians, but delivering yes. for Canadians, uh, mm -hmm. bringing that lens of lived experiences, of communities, of journeys, of rural, of wide neighborhoods, of dense neighborhoods, of food insecurity, whatever the lived experiences are, uh, mm -hmm. if you're interested, I'm sure that the government is interested in having you and because it benefits our delivery on our mandates, collective mandates. What mm -hmm. I will say that isn't sort of public, and this again in terms of new communities are, are a bit late in understanding in my view, uh, the idea mm -hmm. of networks, yes. right? And so when you're talking BEBC is sort of an integrator to support yeah. individual businesses. I encourage black uh, individuals interested in government to be part of networks. You'd be surprised mm -hmm. how many groups, well, on the one hand, you're speaking to departments and government about particular issues in your neighborhood, youth, justice, uh, an apology, business, mm -hmm. uh, women's issues, youth struggles, et cetera, et cetera. And you're also in the room uh, that could be talking about you helping on our side of that work. I myself um, have not always been in government. I, I worked in the private mm -hmm. sector as a leader. I've been first blacks in those spaces, first black in a nonprofit sector, been in and out of government a couple of times. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I can certainly talk about the in steps. My, my main message is that we need you. We need uh, uh, talent. We need that black centric lens. And mm -hmm. so uh, um, because the impact to Canadians matter, and the yeah. network piece is one of the important thing to go with being alert to the uh, appointments as they come out. You can't just simply wait yes. 
on the uh, appointments when they're listed. It's important to mm -hmm. build those relationships uh, in between. That's great advice. I have to thank you so much, Eldon. I, I am so inspired by the work that you do. I'm so inspired by your leadership at ESDC and all the learning I get to get from you. I am just going to be messaging you all the time <laughs> with questions. So you're not going to be able to get rid of me, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> unfortunately for you, That's fortunately for me. Uh, but no, it's yeah, a pleasure. Really it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. There's no, uh, there's no such thing as what we what we sign up for when we take on this work. And I'm obviously, uh, mm -hmm. we ask our communities to be patient with us if we're not able to respond in the kind mm -hmm. of uh, microwave world that we're in. Uh, but uh, your your voice and views uh, and interests are uh, are important to us. Thank you so much again, everyone. I have been talking with Eldon Holder, who is Executive Advisor, UNDPAD at Employment and Social Development Canada, which is ESDC. And as he said, ESDC touches just absolutely everything that we do, both in and outside of business. And so, so thankful for you, uh, Eldon. Have the most wonderful day, and I know you're taking off a holiday soon, so enjoy that as well. Thank you so much. EDC does partners with uh, the legal innovators on our Black Youth Entrepreneur Program, and uh, looking forward to uh, uh, hearing uh, Brittany's journey. So uh, welcome, Melissa. Hello, everyone. Okay, <laughs> we're, we're rolling now. So again, my name is Melissa Allen, uh, Executive Director at League of Innovators. I'm so happy to be joined by uh, two people who I hold near and dear to my heart, Peter and Brittany. And before we get into Brittany's story, I'll just do a, an intro on her. So I believe it was uh, in 2019 you started um, O Foods because you were having some health issues and you were having challenges finding food that agreed with you because as a result of some uh, food allergies you developed. So you started experimenting in your kitchen and then now fast forward to during the pandemic you begin to really really double down on your business scale it and then you're able to work on it full time i believe as of 2021 and at that point you're you're scaling quite quickly just completely bootstrapped you're winning the startup fest montreal uh dollar pitch competition you're winning the uh, bbpa's uh, rise up challenge and now you have seed investment and now you are really set to have O Foods take off. And we are so proud of you and we cannot wait to hear your story. So let's get into it. Yeah, thank you so much, Melissa. Um, so I launched the company um, in actually in September, 2018. Um, and I basically developed my own peanut and tree nut allergies at 18. From there, I started to make my own snacks. Um, just basically was asked if I could um, sell them to different places. Uh, my mom encouraged me to keep going. Uh, ended up selling them into a couple of like yoga studios and retailers. Um, fast forwarded to where we are today. Um, we ended up getting national distribution across Canada and then really growing um, with uh, Walmart Canada. Um, and then with our product line of products that we have right now, we have our snacking bites and then edible cookie dough and really on this whole like inclusive snacking um, mission. We're in 1800 stores across the country, is that correct? Yes, yeah. It, wow, and congratulations. <laughs> yeah, congratulations, that's incredible. Yeah, thank you so exactly. much. No, it's definitely been a journey. And then speaking of that journey, um, what was an element that surprised you most about, especially about entrepreneurship as a young person? Mm. Um, I think something that surprised me the most was probably how much work goes into it. I think a lot of um, us just think like you just put a product in the market and it just goes like basically just sells out right away. Um, but there's a lot that goes behind the scenes of um, like putting the product out there, getting the packaging perfect, um, marketing it, and then also meeting with that buyer, making sure that they're also aligned with your product as well. So I think just how much work actually goes in behind the scenes 
um, was probably something that surprised me early days. Um, whereas before, like when I was first starting, I thought like, oh, I just post on Instagram and then, you know, it should just like blow up overnight. And that's not the case. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, a, that's a really good, yeah, I got, I, that's a really good message to everybody out there. Most young entrepreneurs think, hey, you know what, I'll put it on IG and I'll sell out of my garage, but uh, it doesn't necessarily happen that way. And if it does, they're not really prepared for the how big it can get and uh, and what it, that entails. So, yeah, good yeah. message. Thanks. So in terms of your business, uh, you know, uh, one of the things as an entrepreneur you you find is that it's really important to build a supporting crew around you. Um, who are the people who uh, supported you through this process and how did you, what's the advice you'd give to a younger entrepreneurs on how to build that support system? Yeah, that's a good question. I think from the very beginning, I always like looked for mentors in just different spaces and they didn't necessarily need to be in food. They could be doing just anything um, that I wasn't able to do. So if it was something to do with like finance, for example, um, finding someone who could sit with me maybe once a week and just go over like a spreadsheet or how to do something um, because I wasn't able to like hire someone in for that role. Um, then that was important. One of my mentors that um, just happened to be one of my mentors like by accident, she was like paired with someone else but ended up working out well that she paired with me um, in the end. But um, she just focused on like my mental health and like my emotional intelligence as well. So. Mm -hmm. Um, that was like a really big one, uh, I think, early on that maybe in the very beginning, I didn't see the value. I was like, I don't really know what we're talking about here, like going with my gut or, you know, sticking with whatever's in my mind. Um, but she was really amazing in getting me to like see um, how important like emotional intelligence is, especially when you're growing and scaling and um, things might not go as planned or they go as planned, but they're way bigger than you thought. And um just being intentional um, at every stage of the business. But in terms of how I found people, it was just through like accelerator programs or um, honestly going on LinkedIn, like uh, one of my mentors in that helps in sales, for example, when we were um, trying to scale in 2021, I honestly just found her on LinkedIn. I made a list of people and I just reached out and she was one of the individuals that wanted to connect with me. and. Um, was willing to like go on like weekly calls on um, and that was amazing and helping us like really plan out our year what does that need to look like from a cpg level um and not just like there's like things that you just don't know that you don't know so um i knew there was like a part of the sales cycle that i might be missing and she was great in helping me figure that out um but honestly just linkedin like i i would just see what people are doing um see who they're connecting with and then just reach out um, and a lot of people are willing to connect with you and help you out if you're willing to ask for it. Yeah, exactly. There are two things jumped out at me in, in what you said is one, you know, finding people who can help you in areas that you're, you're, you're not, you don't have the experience there. For instance, sitting down with somebody who who will help you with the spreadsheets is really important. Uh, having the courage to say, I, I don't know how to do this and reaching out for that. The other piece, which is really important uh, in our life uh, right now, is mental health and making sure that you know it, starting a business is is a big undertake and it's stressful, right? Mm -hmm. it's trying to balance, that, especially when you're starting. Um, so I, I I thank you for bringing that up and hope more people take that and and uh, take more care of themselves uh, mentally while going through this process. Yeah, no, for sure. I second that as well. And in fact, uh, you know, what would you advise other Black youth founders watching right now? I know mental health is a big thing. That is there anything else that you would say, would you, would you say right now is the key to know and to understand? Hmm. I think, yeah, I think it starts with your mental health, I will say. I think once I became very clear on like, how certain things make me feel, what motivates me, what gets me up. Um, that helped me a lot. Um, but I'd say like, be willing to ask for help. I know a lot of us just feel like, okay, well, I just wanna do it on my own. I don't want anyone to say that they helped me, but like, I don't know, I'm the first one to say that 
I don't know. And just ask for the help that you actually need because when you ask for help, there's so much more um, that you, like you might be thinking on the surface level, you don't know something, but there's so much more that you actually don't know. And you just, like I said, mm -hmm. you don't know what you don't know. So asking for help from the very beginning um, just really helps elevate you to that next level um, and connects you with different people that you might not have even been connected with if you didn't ask for that help. Absolutely. And, you know, honestly, one of the big, one of the big learnings for me, like also kind of like just growing into a leadership role, similar to you, Brittany, was the fact that you real you start to realize when you start to meet other successful entrepreneurs and founders, is that they did not create their business by themselves. They had a whole team of people around them, supporting them and lifting them up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I think like if you want to like have a business to yourself, then sure, go go do it by yourself. But if you want to really build something that's going to be bigger than you, I would suggest that you surround yourself with like the people that you think you're going to need. Um, and connecting with people early, like I think for me, um, even like when I wasn't ready, I connected with like the Law Blas buyer, um, probably nice. back in 2019, asked for a meeting. Yeah okay let's connect so i already had that connection with him and so when he reached out again last year over linkedin it was like he's already met with me he's seen my post on linkedin it just made sense and it connected him to our story a lot faster than me reaching out when i technically like needed him or wanted to be in loblaws um it just ended up being that they reached out and even just like with my distributor like i didn't reach out to them uh they actually reached out to me so it was just from connecting with people and then sharing your story in like a meaningful way. So like getting on LinkedIn, putting yourself out there um, and connecting with people before you need to connect with them. Yeah, that's a really important point because people's, uh, people talk about social media and using uh, that, that form of media, but it's really important to understand how to use that effectively, uh, not mm -hmm. just posting your pictures, but how you do your research on there is really important. So. It's a good message. Now, in terms of your business, uh, you know, all of us have always talk about this guy inspired me. What was the thing that inspired you into uh, getting into the business and uh, the growth of your business? Yeah, I think I've always been into doing different um, like businesses. So like when I was younger and I was in daycare, um, I used to like in the front, like my daycare was pretty progressive. So they had um, like a radio show that you're able to like be on if you want to do radio. They had like um, every night they let you put out a table if you want to sell things at the front. Um, so stuff like that. And so for me, I was really big in like making different things and then selling them to like the parents or the kids. And so um, I would like make GIMP um, letters and then just sell them off to like you know, different people for their keychains. And then like my dolls had like pillows that my mom helped me make. So then my friends were like, oh, I'd love pillows. And then I started making like doll pillows with like letters on them and selling them. So I think I've always been someone who is like interested in like creating things and selling them and just seeing how far it can go. And my mom always just encouraged me to try different things, even if she didn't think it was like the thing to be doing. Um, she would still be like, yeah, let's try it and like see where it goes. So um, I think that obviously stopped when I went to like when I entered elementary school. And I think just when I was growing up, there was no school um, on entrepreneurship. There's no like you can be a business person. I was like, do you want to be a doctor, a lawyer? Um, like, what do you want to be kind of thing? So um, once I got into college and um, I was actually exiting my last year, um, they started an entrepreneurship program, um, and that's actually how uh, everything kind of came about. And I was already thinking about it at the, at the end of the day. So putting it all together, they helped me with like putting my logo and uh, packaging together. And then um, set me up with different like programs and then kind of went from there. But I think what inspired me um, was just I didn't I knew I didn't want to go into what I was in school studying. Uh, and I knew there was other ways I could use what I just studied, like law. I can, you know, write, do my own incorporations. I can um, do my own uh, trademark, stuff like that. But I just didn't, I knew I didn't want to do that every day for everyone else. And so um, 
yeah, that, that kind of inspired me. And then obviously just having my own food allergies and making my own snacks. I was like, that would be just interesting to see out in the market. And so just got started from there. Um, but I would say no one thing inspired me. I think it was just like various different things of like looking at what do I want in my twenties and, um, and how, how do I want that? my 20s to play out essentially and just build upon that awesome yeah, cool. <laughs> go ahead peter if you have a question then i have one after no, you no, what, <laughs> I, what, what i wanted to say what I, what I actually wanted to say is uh but you know when i look back it's incredible how far this entrepreneurship conversation has come right even the fact mm -hmm. that we put youth entrepreneurship in the beginning of it you know, there's a time entrepreneurship was always thought of somebody older who's experienced or has gone through work work experience and is now branching off to doing their own thing. And it's it's incredible now that, you know, with the work that uh, groups like Melissa and them are doing and now EDC with, in, in um, uh, collaboration with them is really opening those doors to people as as young as they can imagine, they can imagine they can be entrepreneurs to actually be able to step out and uh, and, and try uh, to to make their dreams come true. So it's a really cool story. Yeah. It, it is, it is. And it's, um, I, you know, this actually, thank you, Peter, this like actually perfectly segues into my next question, right? And that is that, um, you know, when I started in, in tech and supporting black founders, like I started dabbling in it in 2018 and then went full time in 2021. There were no, I did not know of any in Canada companies like startups that were, that were, that were black led, especially black women led that had taken or received outside institutional money. And, uh, you know, and then, and now a year, like a year later, um, I, I know of two and, and of course there's room for improvement, but that, but I know we're really at the cusp of something big here. And, and I, and so my question to you is, for all these youth founders, I get a lot of questions about taking investment um, in exchange for equity. When did you know you were ready to take investment? And what would you say to youth founders who like are asking you early on about how to get venture capital? So basically, to, to summarize, questions are when did you know you were ready to take angel and venture capital? And what would you tell uh black youth founders about uh venture capital and how to raise it and if to raise it all yeah um okay so when did i know i was ready um i think i knew i was ready when i think we went in like we were starting to get into a bunch of stores um post pandemic and um and I kind of, I took like 2019, 2020 to like really like look at the market. Like I would like people watch on and I really just knew what like other people were doing. I also would connect with them, ask them questions. Um, and so I only took capital when I knew that that capital I was going to take was going to actually help me scale and I wasn't going to waste that money. Um, I think if I took it prior to like in, 2019 or 2020, I just didn't know what I know now um, with how to scale um, and retail in general. Um, and like, like I said before, I started this, um, you know, in my 20s, so I didn't really have any other like work experience. This has been my work experience other than, you know, working um, at other jobs since I was like 16. But that's very different in terms of like taking a company and scaling it. So. Um, I just knew once I knew um, I could take money and actually scale the vision with our national distribution, with our distributor and uh, with Walmart, and then knew I could keep replicating that over and over again um, and go into the U.S. Um, and we had like a, a co-manufacturer and like I just could see a bigger picture and, and build out for myself. Um, and I had like it was a couple of things like I had like people around me, whether they're mentors or people I could like lean on um, that that were saying like, hey, I think it's it's time like, you know, you, you can't continue to bootstrap this. Um, I think that's when I really took it on. So I, I would say, like, don't take on capital unless you know you can actually do something with it. Um, 
and like help scale your like your startup um, into the next level. If you if you don't feel like you know if you can do that or not, then I just wouldn't. Uh, that's just me. I don't want to like waste anyone's time or resources or money. And I think um, in the long term, that just doesn't help you whether you go and start another business or or um, you need more funding later on. Like if you were able to use that money efficiently the first time, people are a lot more trusting and willing to come in on another round with you. Um, so that's my input. But then. I guess your next question was around, um, like, what would I tell other founders about raising capital if they should or shouldn't? Yeah, yep. I think, um, like I said, raise capital if you have to know a game you're playing. And so I think in the early days, I wasn't playing a game of like, I want to build this and scale it. It was like, let me figure out like what actually is happening in this market and like understand it. Um, and take my time and try different products and find like a really good product that is going to fit. Um, and then once you know that the game is that you want to scale, um, then you kind of go into that. But whatever game that you choose to play, you like you can't back out of it. So just understanding like this is the game I'm playing, and then building a game plan for that um, that game that you're playing. And um, and I, I hate to refer to it as a game, but it really is just all like if you think about like a video game. If you decide to like do certain actions in a game like you can't just back out of it and be like okay well i want to actually go be a good guy instead of a bad guy in the game so you really have to like follow through with it um so when it comes to your business if you're going to take on venture capital just understand that um you've took someone's you've taken someone's money uh they've worked really hard for their money um and just making sure that you understand uh the value of that money and what you're going to do with it um and as long as you're ready for it, then I would suggest taking it because if the longer you take to be like, oh, I'm going to bootstrap, I'm going to bootstrap, you're taking away from your opportunities. So whether that's a, a national launch with a, a certain retailer or um, just scaling to the next level in any kind of way, you're 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 stopping your own growth. Um, so I suggest taking it when you know that you you absolutely are going to do good with it. Um, and don't start searching. I think. Uh, when you need it, like search prior to. So if you know that you're going to need it in a year from now, start building those relationships because no one wants you coming to them um, when you need the money. It's kind of like, you know, when you when you go and ask for like a credit card increase and um, you need it, um, no one's going to give it to you. But when you ask exactly. for it, when you need it, um, you're, you're probably going to get it. So you want to just think about it that way too. Like you don't want to be running to people being like, I need like a hundred K tomorrow. And they're going to be like, that's a little crazy. So um, yeah, I'd say plan in advance and cool. then do it, do it when it makes sense. Great insight. Yeah, Thank you so much. Yeah. That's great advice. Uh, now, speaking of scale, you know, where do you see yourself? And then, you know, I was, was challenged when people ask me that question. I'm like, I'm just focused on what I'm doing right now, but where do you see yourself three to five years from now from a, from you or with your business? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I see us with hopefully a strategic. So I know where we want to go. We want to become a global brand um, and in scaling. So um, just focused on being a global brand and really scaling up the inclusive stocking mission and giving people the access to like allergen friendly snacks that are also gluten free vegan. Um, but then also partnering hopefully with a strategic that can help us take our vision to the next level. Oh, cool. Well, I wish you luck in that, in that journey, but I have no doubt you will make it. Thank you so much. Likewise. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us, Brittany. Amazing insight. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I hope that everybody out there is taking notes. This is a lot of great information. There's a lot to, of value here. So make sure you're taking notes and paying attention. Um, with that being said, what we're gonna do is take a short break, but again, for five minutes. Before that, we're gonna go to Effie for the polls. Hi again, everyone. Thank you for always being here and just tuning in. I wanna quickly mention the polls are still open. So keep using that constantly throughout the day to be able to leave us your feedback. We want to know more about your business and how we can continue to support you further. 
And also I would remind you that every entrance is also put into the draw to win a nice special giveaway. Okay, we're gonna go on a break and we'll come back with more greatness. Wow, can we just thank the dream team, Candice with Sim and Deck for all these tunes? They have been put in on a show. Speaking of, I don't know about you guys, but I, I want cookie dough. I After that break, even those coconut brownie bites, excuse me, but it looks like we are up for time. It is our last five of our top 15 semifinalists. We'll kick it off with someone straight from Winnipeg, Manitoba, Mwenda Dick, who's the founder of South Central Greens. Hi, my name is Mwenda. I'm a 22-year-old Kenyan-Canadian who is currently living in the Fraser Valley. I moved to Chilliwack from Winnipeg at the beginning of the year to pursue my bachelor's in agriculture science. I have since fallen in love with this province and I hope to establish myself here permanently after I finish my studies. I've always had a passion for sustainable farming and health, as these were qualities instilled in me by my family, which farms both in the prairies and in Kenya. I've recently had numerous amazing learning experiences at school that have allowed me to take advantage of many opportunities. I've seen firsthand how food distribution issues increase prices and make it harder for people to access healthy, affordable food. This is where my idea of vertical farming microgreens comes in. Vertical farming is a new practice that uses modern horticulture technology to grow sustainable produce in a space that common farming practices aren't possible. Microgreens are vegetables harvested before the true leaves are formed. These veggies have a much higher nutrient density than their full-grown counterparts. They also mature very quickly and require less inputs than growing traditional produce. This makes them a cheaper and more reliable source of vegetables when compared to spinach or lettuce. During my last semester in school, I was able to research and develop some innovative growing technology with microgreens. I was able to refine some growing techniques, and I also developed a vertical farming system that optimized efficiency and production. My success in this project has led me to create South Central Greens, which is a vertical farm that hopes to serve the community by offering an accessible, healthier alternative to pricey vegetables. I plan to work with local restaurants, farmers markets, and offer a home delivery service. My good friend and business partner owns some ALR land just west of Chilliwack that has some old, unused buildings. I hope to transform an old poultry barn into a full-scale vertical farming operation specializing in microgreen production. $25,000 from the BEBC would help me bring this vision to fruition, as it would cover most of the costs associated with renovating the building and constructing the vertical farm. My dream would be mastering this type of farming with South Central Greens and bringing these food solutions to where it matters the most to me. Food insecurity can negatively impact a community. This type of farming can be a step in the right direction for those living in adverse conditions with limited access to food. I'm specifically talking about the people who live in the Chalbi Desert of Kenya and many other Kenyans who struggle to find a secure source of food. Vertical farming can be done in the most remote regions of the world, and I believe I can make a true difference bringing these techniques to those less fortunate. I have so much more I'd love to share about this passionate project, but I'm running out of time. I hope to hear from the BEBC soon. I'm happy I found such an awesome resource for black businesses. Thank you. You know, with all this talk about food, it's starting to make me think that food is my love language. Let's bring it back, bring it back to be one to give Tony Colley, who is from Toronto, Ontario. Shout out to my hometown. Let's see what you have to give. <laughs> Hi, BBC. My name is Tony Colley, and I'm the founder and CEO of Be One to Give. Canada's first on-demand B2B delivery app for surplus food lost or wasted along the supply chain. We operate similar to Uber Eats. However, we leverage technology and logistics to deliver food with a shelf life of less than 48 hours to agencies supporting those who are food insecure within two hours of receipt. We do this at a cost to retailers of $1 per pound using our packaging or 50 cents per pound using their own. And this includes login access, same day pickups, and daily impact tracking. To date, we redistributed over 25,000 pounds of food to more than 19,000 people, diverting roughly 95,000 pounds of methane gas from the atmosphere. Now, the business stems from my own personal bout with food insecurity starting in 2016. At this time, I found myself on social assistance and food insecure after a 23-year career in corporate finance, fundraising, and event production. 
The only job I could find was part-time for a local caterer, and on my very first event, we had over 100 box lunches left over. Being food insecure, of course, I took a few home for myself and redistributed the surplus to a nearby shelter. I continued that for about a year and a half until one day I decided to purchase a food delivery bag to make the process easier and immediately saw an opportunity to build a more circular and sustainable solution to surplus food recovery. We launched a pilot in late 2019 and three short months later, COVID had shut everybody down. So we spent the past two years developing the technology, bringing it to market, participating in several tech and innovation hubs, and we are now active with five users, one of which we just secured yesterday. If I were to be fortunate enough to secure the fund, the funding, I would use the money towards a new hire of a business development manager that would be solely focused on delivering our sales strategy to our target customers while I'm focused on building out the business and managing the operations. Thank you for your support and have a great day. Bye-bye. Okay, no, no, no. I, t I take it back. Gift giving is definitely my love language. Tony has so much to give and so does our next contestant, Fran Murray, who is the founder of Fran Murray Co. She's from Saga, Ontario. Apologies, Mrs. Saga for you guys that aren't really familiar with the GTA, but shout out to Saga. Let's hear what she has to say. Hi, my name is Fran, owner of Fran Mary Co, a boutique gifting agency located in Mississauga that helps heart-centered businesses maintain key relationships all the while reducing the revenue gap that exists for minority and women-owned small businesses. <laughs> I started baking at the age of nine at my aunt's farm in Northern Ontario and often experimented with flavors. I started Fran Mary Co. in January 2021 during a pandemic while helping a second and fourth grader navigate online learning, running after a toddler, and caring for a baby. Prior to this, I made desserts for family and friends, um, all the while tackling a demanding nine to five. I felt like I wasn't making an impact on my community, so leveraging the relationships I built while networking with female entrepreneurs led me to pairing gourmet treats with non-edible items and creating beautiful gift baskets during the 2021 holiday season. I realized that I could be making a significant impact on my community by um, using local BIPOC owned and women owned businesses in my baskets. So I decided to help reduce the revenue gap for this uh, marginalized community by allowing them access to household they may not otherwise have access to in hopes that the recipients will fall in love with their products, not because of the um, business owner's cultural, um, racial or gender demographic, but because they produce quality products that are of value. The gifting industry is a $258 billion industry with projections of increasing by 8% into 2024. So there's an incredible potential for the revenue gap to be reduced within this demographic of businesses as I, through Fran Marie Co, attract corporations that have buying power. Thanks for your time. You know what? I'm just gonna keep it rolling with my shout outs. Have you guys visited the exhibitor hall yet? There are so many cool booths out there. And speaking of exhibitor booths, I'm going to shout out one also from Toronto. Not, not saying there's favoritism here, but the Marca Agency and Candicia. If it weren't for you, we would not have been introduced to this next contestant, TK Princess Cupid. She is the founder of Textured Hair EDU. And if you don't know, now you know. Hello, Black entrepreneurs. My name is TK, and I am the founder of Textured Hair EDU, which is on a mission to create a more inclusive beauty industry here in Canada and abroad. Currently in 2022, going into 2023, it is not standard for hairdressers to know how to work with curly and Afro textured hair types. So that is what inspired me to create my company Textured Hair EDU. Since 2020, my business has created so much opportunities 
to educate hairdressers, to educate others about curls and afros. And I've been blessed to put all of my money into it <laughs> and hire a team to record digital content as well as to host in-person classes. And it's really helped the people that we've taught, but I want to do more. This year, I tried to connect with the Ministry of Labor um, and Skill Trades, who is responsible for creating the beauty school curriculum, but have not been successful in convincing them the importance of having representation in the beauty industry. Everybody with every hair texture deserves to feel celebrated and be able to walk into a salon and get the services that they need. With the right resources, we can open a black beauty school here in Ontario. And that is my ultimate goal. 25,000 will really help my business. It will help me to fuel more money into creating my digital courses that will one day be used to create my own textured hair curriculum. It will also help to go towards our fund to build a black beauty school. And it will help me to continue to serve the community and create courses and, and workshops for them. So thank you for your time. And I hope I win this money. Man, I got so excited just hearing about hair education because education period is just so important. Now, let me see how I'm gonna, how I'm gonna kind of transition this. So how many of you guys are drivers? Let me, let me know in the chat. Do you, do you guys drive? If you're like me and you're, dri you're driving, looking for a parking spot, and then all of a sudden there are none and you're pulling your hair out. I know Andy, Andy always is just pulling his hair out when he can't find parking. So we, we got a solution. It is called the FISTA app and it is by Martin Belporo of Quebec City, Quebec. Have you ever turned around in the city looking for a parking spot? And do you want to reduce the pollution that is caused by uh, traffic in our cities? I have the solution for you. Fista Technologies is uh, a company that develops an app uh, that will help people finding parking spot within a minute. So what do we uh, propose to our uh, customers we are building an app that will help them find a parking spot at affordable prices and also we will help owners to rent their parking spots so basically we are the Airbnb but for parking spots uh, the 25,000 grants will definitely help us to finalize our prototype and also get our first customer on the app so do you want to help us helping people saving time and money. Join us. Thank you. And just like that, we've seen all 15 of our semi-finalists. And hey, you better tune in because tomorrow we are going to have our top five finalists compete for that grand prize of 25K, a life-changing 25K, and they're pitching live. But in the meantime, you guys can head over to our website, show them some love. All of our top 15 semifinalists are there. Browse through their website, you know, follow them on social, even support them because some of them do provide products. Um, so yes, oh, I'm, I'm getting word that it's, it's time to throw it back to our founder and CEO, Jackie Cassandi. Thank you so much, Cheska. That was such an amazing journey going through all the top 15 finalists, we had such a great um, response to the to the to to our first ever pitch. We, we had over, I think, close to 150 maybe. And so everyone who made it into the top 15 did a marvelous job to get there. And then tomorrow, the top five get to pitch live and it's going to be the most exciting, exciting thing. I want to thank our sponsors today. It's amazing the day we've had today and because of them we got to where we got today. I want to thank everyone uh, at the, in the back end. They've been doing an amazing job today and you can see some of our, of our sponsors there. TD has done a beautiful job, BDC, Cvent, Van City, Volition, RBC, all of them because of them we exist today. 
570 people registered for this event and we've seen people come in and go all day today and then tomorrow is going to be a big blast of a day thank you to everyone who joined us from all over the, the world actually it's so exciting that this is our very second summit and just from starting last year to this year we've been able to expand to where we are i'm hoping you've been as in, as inspired as i was today with britney's story with hearing allison and how well she's doing with hearing from Eldon and the Financial uh, Roundtable. There's so much work that is being done for us as entrepreneurs, as black entrepreneurs. But more importantly, I just love that we get to celebrate us. We get to do this for us. We get to bring each other up. We get to learn from everyone else who's gone bef before us. We get to be inspired by someone who's just still in her youth, like Brittany, and she's doing as well as she's doing, which just, it just tells me that all of us can actually make it. All of us can be successful entrepreneurs and all of us can support each other. So we're gonna have a networking session that's gonna happen right after we are done today. So we'll, you'll move straight into the networking, be in there, share your business, talk about your business, tell everyone uh, about your business because the more we know about each other's business, the more we can actually promote us, ourselves and each other. If someone has a travel agency, for example, and they're curating things for, for uh, black people to travel, it's great if someone else is asking you about travel to actually refer to them. And so let's do that. Let's start to support each other. And thank you so much for having uh, spent your day with us. It was a really beautiful but long day. Ask us any questions. You can go on our website. You can connect with us on social media, book meetings to meet with us. BEBC exists to support every black entrepreneur and it's free. It doesn't matter what you need. If you go on our websites, you can you can book a meeting with us. You can email us at info at bebcsociety.org. Anything you need, we exist to help make us all successfully. So head over to the networking session and we'll have a lightning round in there. There's things to be won. There's some really good uh, gift baskets you can win. There's a survey uh, that is in your portal right now that you can do. And the polls, there's so many amazing gifts to be won. So stay, be stay back have the gamification, network with us, and see you all tomorrow. Tomorrow is Saturday, so we all have a bit more time. So we're looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. And thank you so much for joining us today. And have a wonderful day or night or evening since you're all from around the world today. Thank you. It was good to have you today.